and then we can start uh, as quickly as possible. I'm seeing that Stefano Grassi is also joining us. Stefano, buongiorno, buon pomeriggio. Buon pomeriggio, dovreste anche vedermi tra poco. Live from Berlemont. Live from Berlemont. Mi, mi rendo presentabile, intanto un caro saluto anche all'amico Lapo, che vedo dopo tanto tempo sullo schermo. Welcome, Mr. Grassi. I also want to welcome all uh, the people that are uh, following us on the YouTube web channel. Uh, and uh, in a few minutes, we will start. Uh, we are waiting for the chairman of the Italian Energy Authority. And uh, we will start with a brief address from Marco Maggieri. So thank you to all of you that uh, are connected. And uh, so enjoy the, the meeting. Here we have Stefano. Uh, buongiorno Stefano, Stefano Besseghini, no? Only Grassi. Uh, Stefano, benvenuto. Buongiorno, ciao, buongiorno. Nice to meet you and everybody. Ciao Stefano. Ciao, ciao. So... Anzi, ciao ai due Stefano, perché in realtà ne sto salutando due in contemporanea. So I think, Marco, we can start our meeting. Uh, our dialogue on the Mediterranean energy uh, perspectives and uh, thank you for all of you that uh, are connected. So, Marco, the floor is yours for uh, the introduction. Uh, grazie, Paolo. Good morning, everyone. Uh, bienvenue, les amis de, de la région méditerranéenne, uh, les amis francophones. Um, it is really a pleasure to see that distance uh, is brought closer this time by cameras. Uh, I have to say this dialogue that uh, WEC Italy and the World Energy Council enjoy with the Observatoire Mediterranean de l'Energie has traveled a number of miles. I do remember occasions in Milan, I do remember occasions in Abu Dhabi, I do remember occasions throughout the region in Naples, in Algiers. And I have to say uh, today is really a, a, an opportunity for us uh, to set in stone the need for this dialogue to continue. And let me, uh, I understand that Stefano Besseghini, the chairman of the Italian Regulatory Authority and with his authority, the host of MedReg, promoter uh, and host of MedReg has a hard stop. So I will not uh, bother you too much with my reflections, but let me just say that uh, this dialogue appears to be essential because of three cleavages. Uh, the cleavage of geographies, uh, the two of two of which we are we are stating in the title, the, the, the cleavage of geographies, where we do have a clear imbalance, as the work of OME uh, doesn't uh, stop to show in a very articulate and profound manner. Uh, there, there is imbalances in development in, in patterns. There is imbalances in need, but there is one shared need across the region uh, for sustainable transition combined, and this is a, a topic that I will leave uh, to Angela Wilkinson, uh, Secretary General of, of WEC, combined with a significant need, like in few other places in the world, for a combination between sustainable uh, economic and human development, this human dimension that binds and Hudalal uh, knows it be better than anybody uh, uh, of us having traveled the region extensively. Uh, that binds us in the region immensely. The second, uh, the second aspect uh, is that of alliances. We know that uh, this is a region where more often than not, uh, above ground issues, as old oil men call them, now uh, energies are above ground as well, so we should find another name, uh, but issues that have nothing to do with technology and investments are hampering development. So I think we will need to find some strength and we have an external strength today. I'm speaking to you from Washington where I can measure on a daily basis how the new administration is willing 
to re-engage with the Mediterranean, is willing to engage with the partners of this region, is, willing, is really willing to weave again the fabric of our, of our cooperation, but we will need to find alliances from within. Uh, on April 21st, um, the Ministerial of the Union for the Mediterranean will gather. I will leave it to experts and diplomats to understand what is the degree of, of uh, fitness, of fixing the machinery, of establishing new concepts and new ideas as uh, with Huda uh, we could witness in Rome in 2014 with the birth of the uh, energy platforms of the Union for the Mediterranean. Creativity will definitely be needed. But clearly, we need to go in the direction of weaving our internal fabric as well. And let me commend the European Commission for doing that uh, on at least two occasions. One was a few days ago with the, the new strategy for the southern neighborhood, and the one was the other one was a few um, a few months ago with the strategy for hydrogen, where I think it was visionary for the Commission to state clearly not only that OME can help, and of course we, we, we couldn't encourage it more, but also that uh, new technologies, new energy breakthroughs have to be into our internal fabric. So not only cooperation on establishing interconnections as we need to do, of establishing peer-to-peer -peer trade in the region, uh, cooperation in uh, using gas resources that can be sustainably put to the advantage of phasing out more polluting fuels uh, in many areas of the of, of a resource wealthy uh, area of the world, but also cooperation between our partners and new technologies. And here is where I do see WEC coming uh, into the picture, bridging companies, institutions, academia, uh, helping with the help of, of, of OME, designing ideas and concepts that can foster uh, they, they can foster actual cooperations. We are finding a number of partners here, and Stefano Besseghini will allow me one second, not only to thank him, uh, Arera and Medreg, for the steady and standing cooperation we enjoy, uh, but also uh, let me flag uh, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, not only one of our founding members, but really a promoter of this dialogue um, and, and a great encouragement. So, uh, Luca Sabatucci. It is a pleasure uh, to have you here, uh, Director General of the Ministry, uh, and it is a pleasure to work with you and colleagues of your team on a daily basis. We thank you for the uh, extensive work and extensive energy that you're putting uh, in, in our efforts. Uh, let me thank the European Commission uh, and Stefano Grassi for being, uh, for being with us today. I, I really do believe that the European Commission is uh, a fundamental pillar of this uh, re relaunching uh, of the cooperation. And let me say, and this is the last comment I wanted to make, that I do really hope uh, that with the help uh, of the number of projects and, 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 and companies, uh, I, I, I am welcoming friends from Italian companies, from, from SNAM, from Edison, and I'm seeing that uh, dealing with the Mediterranean also is fostering a number of friends in there individual careers and responsibilities. And so let me commend Maria Rita Galli on her recent appointment uh, as CEO of DESFA. Uh, so she's participating with a twin I I Italian uh, and, and Greek hat. And let me commend Fabrizio Martana and Edison for uh, their efforts on a number of endeavors for sustainable energy and mobility, uh, including on small scale LNG and on a number of other uh, of other projects and thank uh, and thank you uh, Fabrizio for the partnership uh, on this um, on this particular event. So uh, we, what we need, I think, is to have the Mediterranean at the center, front and center of our priorities. Uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum was, for example, a very important movement forward. Now we hope that the Italian Parliament will also ratify the treaty. Rome, Rome has a Sometimes traffic in Rome is busy, uh, as in many and as, as, in, as in many capitals. But we will definitely uh, continue. I, I hope uh, to see Italy as a as a steadfast promoter of cooperation throughout the region in whichever format. So let me 
let me conclude by, by remembering one of the sentences that I think uh, does represent best uh, the, uh, the effort we, we, we are in. A, a German, like our German friends that will travel through the Mediterranean with new technologies and new endeavors, but he was not traveling with new technologies, Rainer Maria Rieke, uh, spent some time on the Mediterranean in Duino, in one of the most beautiful places in Italy. And he came up with a definition of what, on how he saw the world that I think well describes the Mediterranean. A threadbare carpet worn thinner by perpetual upspring. This is us in the Mediterranean. It's a, it, it's a carpet that risks, it's very delicate, it's very fragile. It needs fuel quality, it needs renewable energies, it needs sustainable power generation to phase out uh, oil and coal. It needs a combination of those people who are on this threadbare carpet to see the world with positive and convergent eyes. So I think we will be giving, we will be giving our small contribution here. And I have spoken too much, taking too much time out of my friend, uh, Stefano Beseghini, whom I thank for opening our seminar today and whom I thank for the work, uh, extensive work that Arela, the Italian regulator, is, uh, dedicating to, um, is dedicating to energy cooperation in the Mediterranean. Uh, I may only ask our colleagues to mute their microphones and I will leave the floor to Stefano with no further ado. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Marco. Uh, thank you all for this invitation, uh, which I uh, accepted very gladly because uh, this occasion to talk about uh, the Mediterranean area is for me uh, a moment that I need to take uh, because uh, uh, such is the importance uh, that uh, as authority we give uh, to the development of this area, to the potential and to contribution that we can give uh, to good interrelationship uh, between uh, uh, the countries in the, in the Mediterranean area that uh, I cannot avoid to be, uh, to be present, even if a little bit squeezed <laughs> between <laughs> several, several duties. Uh, as uh, as Marco mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, I'm here with uh, double hat uh, because, of course, uh, we talk as uh, the regulator, but also as a vice president, permanent vice president of the drag, uh, which is probably an institution that is very well known to all of you. At least I hope uh, it's uh, very well known to all of you uh, because it deserves uh, this attention. Uh, and. Um, I think uh, this is uh, a doublet uh, that uh, I wear proudly because uh, uh, we started this uh, idea of Medreg uh, several years ago and I have to say that uh, the experience increased uh, during the years uh, and uh, we developed a uh, uh, new relationship uh, nowadays uh, Medreg is uh, an association that counts uh, uh, more than 27 uh, uh, energy regulators among the Mediterranean. I think uh, that everybody uh, is present, of course, and uh, the activity of the parties, uh, the city association is uh, at a different levels, but uh, there is a, a common view and a constant uh, effort to build uh, uh, activities and relationships that can be really useful. But uh, which is the, the basic idea? Uh, uh, there is somebody that is uh, clicking on the keyboard. Uh, if it is possible to switch out the microphone, it would be useful because it's very noisy to have this tick tick in the, in the air. So sorry for, uh, for, for this request. Well, uh, let me say that uh, uh, what we are trying uh, to do, of course, uh, the, the activity of Madrag uh, was born uh, like uh, an effort to favor the cooperation, the collaboration among the regulators. But um, uh, I think that uh, a lot of things changed uh, during the, the years uh, and uh, came out uh, clearly, uh, always uh, more clearly, that uh, uh, the, the potential of establishing this kind of thing, uh, the possibility to have uh, a key role in uh, building what is called uh, the capacity building, uh, the, uh, the increase of the expertise, of the common understanding of problem and issues uh, that you have to face uh, as a regulator when uh, dealing uh, with the energy 
uh, issues that are always uh, uh, issues uh, quite complicated uh, and uh, that ca come uh, close uh, in the field uh, uh, the different uh, uh, topics uh, the technological approach uh, the regulatory issues uh, strictly intended uh, and of course also the understanding of the economics uh, and the, of uh, the geopolitical role that uh, you are going to play uh, within uh, the relationship and i think that this focus on the common discussion and the possibility to have this uh, common understanding uh, in uh, the different worker group uh, uh, that uh, uh, madrag animate animate is uh, is uh, a lot of experience that we have built and uh, the, the feedback that we usually have uh, from our partners is uh, of appreciation but uh, I think uh, I will come uh, now shortly to the trilemma and to what uh, as Medreg, uh, we are, uh, 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 what Medreg is doing uh, on the different issues. Uh, we we'll try to remind something, uh, some, some concept, of course, not some details uh, uh, in general. But uh, let me just uh, focus one point uh, uh, that is uh, specifically a point uh, on uh, sustainability that is a concept and an idea that uh, we have uh, worked out uh, uh, in several years uh, of discussion understandings uh, uh, new uh, ideas that have been implemented uh, i think uh, in important uh, uh, legislative and uh, regulatory uh, frameworks uh, that change the dramatic if we turn your hand back uh, only 10 years uh, from now you will uh, probably uh, understand uh, and appreciate the huge amount of work that has been done uh, in a relatively short uh, uh, time. Of course, uh, one point is uh, the indication of the regulatory framework of the uh, legislative framework, and another is the implementation of the different uh, uh, acts, uh, uh, effects. Uh, at the national level or in the interrelationship between the different uh, uh, states but uh, but uh, uh, what is of the discussion is that uh, uh, a lot uh, of uh, uh, increasing uh, has been uh, uh, has been done but uh, we are in an area the mediterranean i mean in which things uh, move uh, clearly at different uh, steps of uh, and different uh, speed of evolution of the concept and so uh, the, the effort, I think the, the main effort that uh, an association like Medrag tries to do is uh, to share this uh, view, this knowledge, this understanding of how things uh, can be uh, progressively pushed towards uh, the idea of sustainability, which is not uh, uh, a common title in all the countries. I mean, it's not that... Uh, uh, simply the fact that you name the things in the same way means that you understand the things in the same way. Uh, there is always a, a need to clearly identify the details, clearly work out uh, uh, how do you decline in the regulatory framework or the legislative framework uh, uh, the different uh, ideas that you are trying to uh, develop and uh, pursue. And uh, I think that uh, one of the reasons in my view for the appreciation of the work done by Medrag even by the European Commission is strictly related to the idea that you are able to be a permanent forum of discussion in order to promote and and, uh, and spread these ideas. Of course, uh, not in a single way, otherwise it would be uh, probably uh, a naive and uh, deemed to unsuccess uh, approach. It's a, a bilateral way, uh, multilateral way actually. I mean, uh, during this uh, uh, discussion and uh, uh, deepening of the different uh, topics uh, on which uh, we are active, uh, of course, you are able to understand uh, clearly and to have a more clear view on uh, the expectations and the evaluations and the uh, time frame, which is another important issue, the time frames on which you are you think that you are able to implement uh, some idea or some uh, project because. Uh, I always uh, state this uh, uh, time frame makes a difference. I mean, uh, of course, we can share common objectives quite uh, 
uh, quickly. Uh, what makes the difference very often is uh, the time on which we, uh, we, we deploy, or we, uh, the time on which we think to deploy this, uh, uh, this activity. So uh, I think that all the opportunities, all the occasions that we have uh, uh, to share this understanding of uh, what we mean for sustainability, which is one part of the trilemma, of course, uh, it's uh, an important uh, uh, opportunity. Um, of course, uh, uh, just to come very quickly to the other two uh, parts, which are security and equity, uh, I have to say that uh, from the point of security, it's probably one of the central and, uh, uh, and the probably uh, Aborigin uh, discussion that we had uh, within the drag, because of course, security of supply, uh, both for the electricity and the uh, gas sector, are somehow central in uh, such a diverse, uh, diversified uh, number of sources uh, as you uh, experience, uh, as experience in the in the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, we had um, a special focus on. Uh, an approach that we named as uh, sub-regional regulatory convergence, uh, because of course uh, it's quite uh, naive to have the idea that you can uh, simply imagine a common view of the regulatory issues uh, on such uh, a diverse and widespread uh, uh, situation like the one that you experience in the Mediterranean, but you can build up on different kernels, on different uh, uh, groups in which you can try to harmonize and to better to increase the relationship between uh, the different uh, countries involved. Uh, of course, there is no need for me to underline uh, to you that how very well the situation how can be difficult to manage a multilateral approach uh, in this uh, in this area in the area of the energy with uh, such a diverse understanding of the long term uh, evolution and top perspective and also with some. Uh, we have to say very quick uh, uh, introduction of new, maybe not of new technologies, but of new opportunities given by relatively old technologies that comes uh, with uh, just things about uh, the liquefied uh, natural gas uh, uh, infrastructure. I'll change that dramatically and quite quickly the uh, perspective and evolution of uh, state of the, the pipeline infrastructures or. Uh, if you think about uh, the impact of renewables uh, in, uh, in a system with a great legacy like the European one or in a system with uh, a relatively, not say green field, but uh, for sure, for sure uh, less uh, structured infrastructure like the ones I do sometimes experience in the uh, South Shore uh, countries. So, of course, uh, uh, we must be very practical, very pragmatic, I mean, in the approach to have a clear, in deep understanding of what is the situation uh, on the field. Uh, otherwise, if you try to speculate, uh, let's say, on some uh, theoretical or general approach, uh, uh, apart from the goodwill that is always shared, and we have to be uh, ready to share every time, uh, we must be aware of the difficulties. We must be aware of uh, uh, the need to take care uh, of the opportunities and of the that, uh, exhibit in any level uh, of the discussion. Uh, let me finish uh, with, uh, I think that I have greatly overconsumed my time, but just uh, a few words on equity, because uh, another topic that we, uh, that I personally even try to uh, import uh, in, the, in the discussion uh, every time at the metric level is uh, the consumer protection, uh, the understanding of what uh, we mean by consumer in uh, uh, such different systems and such different uh, countries. Even a very nice uh, topic like uh, very uh, common, at least the European discussion, like the one of energy poverty, takes a completely different uh, uh, aspects and uh, and uh, nuances uh, if uh, you decline it uh, uh, in uh, the overall view of the Mediterranean uh, region. And uh, it's uh, an interesting uh, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, shop, I would say, to test. Uh, our understanding and our definitions and our 
uh, approaches uh, to concepts uh, that can be schematically uh, shared uh, in uh, an European vision, for example, but when they come out and they compare with other countries uh, with different level of development of uh, the rights and of the, uh, and the law uh, and, the, and, the, and the framework and the legislative framework to which you compare, you must be very uh, aware of this. For, for, for this re even for this reason, I think that uh, the capability of a forum like Medreg to, to build uh, and to share knowledge about uh, uh, this uh, 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 capability to, to act as a chain uh, that connects uh, uh, the European part uh, with uh, the other part of the Mediterranean is uh, a central role. Of course, uh, there will be other forum and other opportunities in which you discuss uh, more political issues and you come to the uh, close definition of uh, the agreements, uh, the facts, uh, and so on. And I think we must be able to be on uh, a good uh, uh, on the side of this kind of activities uh, in order to give the opportunity to have uh, uh, a view, a place in which uh, we can share those technical details uh, that sometimes can hinder uh, the, uh, let's say, safe development uh, of the agreement that you can uh, share at uh, the highest level of uh, the understanding of the common objectives. Because uh, unfortunately, many times, uh, failures come from the details. So we must be able even to manage uh, uh, with this uh, very thin and subtle uh, details that sometimes regulation can uh, uh, give an opportunity from this uh, point of view. Uh, I hope that uh, this uh, discussion today will be another opportunity to share this kind of uh, understandings. Uh, I have took, uh, took uh, probably even too much time, so I stop here. I thank you for the opportunity. I will stay with you as long as I can, for sure. Uh, and afterwards, I will quietly leave uh, the meeting uh, in order to give uh, the discussion going on. Thank you very much. G Grazie mille. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano. Thank you very much, uh, President Besseghini, for uh, opening uh, our, our seminar by using the framework of the trilemma, uh, which is the framework that I think uh, WEC brings to the debate uh, as, a, uh, as a flagship conceptual way to understand energy policies and we'll come to that in a second as I uh, happily uh, leave the floor uh, to Angela, Angela Wilkinson. But let me not forget to flag two dimensions that you highlighted amongst many. Uh, one is the dimension of time and I do believe that uh, especially as the transition uh, combines. I, I, I see our friend Angelo Ferrante from Terna, and a good friend from Terna used a, a, a phrase for the energy transition that I will never forget. It's like changing the wheels of a car as the car is moving. So the way that you adopt timing in, in, in this uh, complicated operation, especially as the conditions around such an intertwined rim, a set of rims of the Mediterranean uh, are so divergent, I think the time time is definitely of essence, and thank you for for flagging that. And the second is uh, the multidimensional set of actors, type of corporations, and understanding that we need to to put together. The one fits all dimension in the Mediterranean probably uh, has a difficulty uh, to work because of the differences uh, across many countries. And uh, let me. Uh, je, je veux à nouveau saluer nos amis qui nous ont rejoints uh, du Liban, d'Algérie, de Tunisie. Malheureusement, unfortunately, our friends from Morocco had a very last-minute uh, difficulty. Uh, and, 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 and let me also flag that I'm sure that Lapo Pistelli, who has who is here in, in in many capacities, many fortunate, including the one of being the uh, the new chairman of OME. I think it's your first. Uh, a, a public appearance in that capacity in Italy, so we thank you for that. And for his last, fortune, his least fortunate capacity is that of my boss, but that, that, that will leave it to uh, that will leave it to behind the scenes. Uh, so, 
with no further ado, uh, again, thank you very much, Stefano, for your, for your introduction. And we'll look forward to continuing this cooperation and working together. Uh, and I think, uh, Angela, uh, thank you for uh, changing a bit the order, but uh, I think it was an excellent introduction to uh, your comments on how uh, we at the World Energy Council from uh, the, the, the very important viewpoint that you have in London, see the trilemma evolving and the quest for humanizing energy uh, as uh, the crucial quest that we have in the, in the pathway to the transition. So Angela, the floor is yours and thank you again for being with us. Apologies, you're on mute. Thank you, Marco, for those warm words. And um, let's see if we can weave a magic carpet. And I'm going to share really the how-to specialism of the World Energy Council in being very practical and engaging in diversity in energy for nearly 100 years. So let me build on those experiences. I'd like to thank our Italian member committee and OME for organizing this timely and important event. In particular, I'd like to give a special mention to Paolo De Erma for working so hard to pull it together and for the excellent planning. Now, the Mediterranean is emerging as an important and dynamic energy region where North meets South, East meets West, and new cooperations are focusing on renewables at scale, uh, securing natural gas and LNG, and trade in clean hydrogen based fuels. The region is fascinating both from a new energy uses and a diversity of supply perspective. Regional geography, however, though, does not stand still and the pace of change is getting faster. Human geography is also shifting, shaped by new energy needs and interests, including demand for summer cooling, zero waste societies and digital productivity. My colleague Martin Young is going to share details of our Mediterranean work with you later in the programme, and he'll introduce our Agile Insights Engine, as we call it, which can vary the focus on the regional energy leadership agenda by geography, thematically, and by exchanging and contrasting perspectives. My job today is to remind us all that global energy transition is first and always a story of humanizing energy. Success in the races to zero will involve multiple pathways and the pace of technology change and the speed of market solutions will need to be managed by people and affordable to societies. Context matters. To illustrate this point, let me recall the origins of the World Energy Council as the first, the world's first permanent organ, energy organization and expert community. We started up as the World Power Conference in 1924, when the world was recovering from the first global influenza pandemic and about to face the Great Depression. Sounds familiar, yes? But the international context was different. It was an era of energy for peace, the formation of the UN, the World Bank and the IEA all came later. Now, the world energy industry and our open to all energy community is focused on the imperative of global energy transition in an era of energy for planet and people. We work together to progress an agenda of more energy and climate neutrality, which secures the benefits of sustainable energy for all. During the, world, the 24th World Energy Congress in Abu Dhabi, 18,000 of us gathered and noted that value generation is moving closer to the end user. We highlighted a shift in leadership mindset from supply side thinking to demand driven solutions and started to work on the how to anticipate a new customer centric energy future. To do this, we've added a fourth D to the three global drivers of change we have tracked for over a decade. The four Ds are decarbonisation, with the ambition of achieving a climate neutral energy system by 2050. Decentralisation, the accelerating pace of distributed and renewable power generation. Digitalisation, which brings a step change in energy efficiency and process improvements. And disruption by demand which highlights that the ways in which energy is being used, traded and transported are changing fast. The new pattern of demand side disruptive innovation is messy and broad, and it's not the same as the push of a new technology or the fall in price of solar or wind power. 
Success involves engaging effectively with the pull of connected energy societies and embracing diversity in energy, not only technologies, pathways and mix, but also diversity in people, skills, business models and new energy visions. Managing energy transition is a balancing act. There's no one size fits all. And Marco's already mentioned that there is a spectrum of solutions emerging. Regional transition pathways differ and we, the World Energy Council, engage multiple geographies and all energies as a source of innovation, insight, new cooperation and resilience. The how to secure clean, affordable, reliable and equitable energy transition for Western Europe, Asia or Africa may not be right for the Mediterranean region and vice versa. Covid has been a brutal shock to all societies. It's also provided a glimpse of clean energy futures, clear skies, quiet cities, uncongested streets, and shown that individual actions can have a positive global outcome. The crisis has also reminded us all of the importance of energies in our life, energy for health, hospitals, fridges for vaccines, for schooling and working from home and for digital events like this one. Recovery from crisis is a bigger story of humanizing energies. It's not all about carbon or electrification. Access to modern energies is the ultimate connector of hopes and fears of people and geographies. Now, as the unevenness of impacts has revealed, energy is not a single sector. The world and Mediterranean energy industries are complex and interdependent systems. And whilst we should expect some permanent disruption of energy demand in some places, we must also prepare for the return of global energy demand growth and, and, and anticipate new energy uses. Recovery will not be easy, even with a vaccine. Resilience has been tested and now extends to people and supply chains. Sorry. And most of all, excuse me, and resilience has been well, is not easy, even with a vacuum, and has been tested and will re require to. And as the pandemic context continues to unfold, a new context of affordability and social justice has started to crystallize. It's clear that the energy future is going to be more demanding, literally. The same hold truths in the Mediterranean region. Primary energy demand in the region is expected to grow substantially over the next 25 years, spurred by sustained population and economic development. The social energy agenda is moving up the political uh, agenda in many countries. And for investors and energy businesses, it will involve new metrics for the S in ESG reporting. As Martin will show us later, multiple energy issues play a major role in shaping the future of the Mediterranean region, socially, politically and economically, and will continue to do so. 2021 is not just another year, it's another world. And these are turbulent times for energy transition. Competition to accelerate energy system innovation turning points and scale new energy innovation ecosystems is intensifying and involves new and unconventional players. At the same time, we will need to work together to avoid transition triggered crisis and new energy shocks. Build forward better will require recovery planning to build in resilience along regionally diverse pathways and with active involvement of users and anticipation of new winners and losers. We'll need to re redesign energy markets for customer centricity. And we, as we've always done, our community expects to exchange practical know-how and share learning about how to do this. Energy transition is a messy process involving multiple issues and diverse interests. Societies need us to help them join the dots. That's why we created the World Energy Trilemma Index over a decade ago. It's designed to help energy leaders across the world balance the need for energy security, equity and affordability and environmental sustainability as they strive to build and transform their underlying energy systems. Now, in our 2020 report, Italy, for example, ranks 11th place amongst the top performing countries. 
Other Mediterraneans, uh, other, other Mediterranean countries such as France are fifth, Croatia 23rd, Israel 38th, Greece 39, Morocco and Lebanon rank in the 70s. Now, by looking at how countries achieve year on year performance, it's possible to learn with and from each other. Our World Energy uh, Issues Monitor compares and contrasts global and regional versus national perspectives on which issues matter most. It identifies what's keeping energy leaders awake at night and how action priorities are changing. In the Mediterranean region, we see that the new context of economic uncertainty is the major concern and that energy efficiency and renewable power remain action priorities. As we've done for nearly 100 years, our members across nearly 90 countries have been sharing their experiences, actions and outlooks to the crisis. And to help energy leaders with the essential job of recovery, we have developed a set of four COVID crisis scenarios to 2024. They're called pause, rewind, fast forward and re-record. We've used these scenarios to build the first world energy transition radar, which decodes real-time signals from across the world and helps us assess the direction and pace of global energy transition. The global radar shows that we're detecting more signals for the two high trust, high transformation scenarios, re-record and fast forward. The regional snapshots show very different stories of what is emerging and reflects the diversity and energy of those localities. We can use these tools to better inform how to design new options, to stress test recovery plans, and to better prepare post-pandemic investment strategies. Our long-term world energy scenarios to 2024 explore innovation turning points, which emerge between the pull of connected energy societies and the push of new technologies. The global energy transition pivots on how to accelerate these innovation turning points without triggering a transition crisis and new energy shocks. Now, innovation and cooperation remain the keys to successful recovery and transformation. But innovation is not the same as progress, and the difference is humanizing energy. Societies need to avoid the, pres the, the risk of technology prescription in policy. Cooperation extends beyond government and global energy firms to involving many and more diverse people and communities in building energy transition forward. That's why in 2021, we're linking our pragmatic humanizing energy agenda to the races to zero agendas of the COP26 and the growing number of countries, cities and companies signing up. The world will need many and more diverse clean and net zero carbon uh, energy solutions and investment opportunities. As we move to 2021, we're going to focus on these three areas. Setting a human pace by involving energy users and people and communities impacted by transition in the races to zero agenda. Recovery with resilience and diversity and extending resilience to people and supply chains and supporting agile regional cooperations and build forward together, resetting market design for the shift to customer centricity. The Council will continue to use our heritage and independence to help societies understand that new and inspiring models of human and economic development, digital, circular, clean and just, all will require more energy and better quality energy access, at least in the medium term. The world needs more energy and better energies for all of humanity to stop fueling fear of the future. Our new narrative of humanizing energy for people and planet can ensure that no one is left behind and inspire societies to keep reaching for the stars. This narrative provides the theme for the St. Petersburg World Energy Congress in 2022, Energy for Humanity. Now, I believe it takes a diverse energy community to build and change an entire energy system. So please add your voices and play your part in avoiding the growing risk of fragmentation and polarization and pulling together with us 
the world energy community. I'm confident that as we approach our 100th anniversary, it will be a moment of celebration of all that the world energy community will have achieved in humanizing energy and inspiring new possibilities for humanity. I wish you inspired exchanges and dynamic discussions and look forward to learning how we can build forward together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. And uh, thank you also for phrasing this build forward better, which I think is, uh, is a better phrase than the one we have experienced here in the, in, in, in the United States. And I'm sure that many of these concepts will also echo in, uh, in, our, for, in our future panel with uh, friends from the industry. And I think uh, LAPO will also uh, flag what uh, ENI is doing in the region of uh, customer centricity and evolving this platform. Uh, along with mm, colleagues uh, from other companies. Um, you also Marco, mentioned... Uh, Marco, only an agenda issue, excuse me for interrupting you. Yeah. Uh, Director General Luca Sabatucci has left the meeting at 3.30. So if yeah, after yeah. your... your uh, Perfect. Okay. Uh, uh, especially because Angela quoted people, planet and prosperity. So I wanted to ask Stefano the permission to give the floor to the presidency of the G20 with the Italian Ministry of Foreign, of Foreign Affairs, because that is exactly the G20, uh, the G20 uh, topic that uh, Italy has been put, putting forward and it is discussing today. So Stefano, if you can bear with us uh, for, for some more minutes, uh, with your permission, I would ask uh, Luca to intervene uh, and bring that perspective. Marco, permission granted, of course, but you have to excuse me as well because I need to see the Commissioner at 3.30 for about one hour, so I will join you back at 4.30. Okay, okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Apologies for, no, 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 uh, don't worry. for this Mediterranean uh, traffic jam in the, in the, uh, in the meeting, but we, we, we look forward to having you back as soon as you can. And um, Luca, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Uh, désolé pour les amis francophones parce que mon intervention uh, sera en anglais. Um, I, I will focus uh, really on energy, even if uh, uh, the uh, pillars of the G20 uh, are, uh, as you mentioned, people, uh, planet prosperity. Uh, that means that that, uh, that energy will have uh, really a major part uh, in, the, in the G20 uh, program uh, of, uh, of Italy. Um, first of all, let me thank the World Energy Council and her Secretary General for hosting today's talk uh, on the energy transition uh, with a particular focus on the Mediterranean. Um, accelerating the clean energy transition to halt climate change is, uh, uh, um, as a matter of fact, at the core of the Italian G20 presidency, uh, as well as our prominent role in the COP26 uh, as partner of the UK. Italy it means to show uh, leadership towards the future with net zero emissions by mid-century in line with the EU targets. Uh, now, more than ever before, such a target has been gaining momentum. Italy, you know, is a Mediterranean country by definition, uniquely posed as a bridge among all the shores of our sea. Energy is essential, it's an essential key <clears throat> to understanding the dynamics of the Mediterranean. Uh, where it really constitutes a physical, economic, and political bridge between the countries of the region. Uh, the area is an historical hub for global energy flows. Traditionally, oil and gas have domina dominated the Mediterranean energy picture, characterized in large part by a one-way relationship from the south northward Historically, up to 50% of the energy exports from the Mediterranean Africa uh, shores has reached Europe, 
and over 6,000 kilometers of gas pipelines uh, have been built. Energy trade in the area will remain a vital pillar, but it will progressively change nature and dynamics in the light of the already mentioned objectives of climate neutrality of the European Union by 2050. Um, the traditional one-way flow is deemed to become a two-way cooperation characterized by a greater electricity exchange from renewable energy sources and the use of the infrastructures with which the EU today imports around 13% of its natural gas from North Africa to transport increasing shares of biogas and green hydrogen. Moreover, our mutual collaboration is deemed to spread to innovative energy technologies and solutions for energy efficiency. The technological collaboration is going to be more than ever driven to empower self-production and self-reliance for energy supply, bringing added value to the economy and creating far more jobs than old technologies all of which contributing to create, to create a highly skilled managers and workforce. Um, the sustained development of clean energy technologies is driven by the rap rapid decline in their prices, notably of renewable energy, accompanied by the progressive loss of appeal of old production systems based on the combustions of particularly polluting sources like coal. The great availability of renewable resources and natural gas in the region plays therefore a strategic role, combining environmental sustainability with energy in many countries. The International Energy Agency foresees that renewable capacity in the Middle East region and North Africa will double over the next four years, driven by solar and stimulated by private sector investment. Basically, all the Mediterranean countries are willing to make the most of the vast potential available to respond and to the, grow, to the growing energy consumption, linked to a fast increasing population and very dynamic economies. Some IMF figures say that North Africa is estimated to grow at a rate of 4% annually uh, until uh, 2024, with significant peaks for some countries, uh, such as Egypt, that could reach 6%. Also, the eastern shore of the Mediterranean and the Balkans are expected to have sustained rates over the next few years, of course, once the pandemic is over. However, too many Mediterranean countries still rely excessively on coal and oil in their energy mix. In certain countries, electricity is generated by coal power plant for over 40% of the total production. Political instability, difficulties to reconvert existing plants, lack of incentives, high prices, poor energy governance, insufficient investments have been for too long time hindering a low carbon and sustainable conversion. But things have been changing. Italy is at the center of this uh, shift. We have in effect registered a concrete willingness to harness the full potential of nuclear technologies and low carbon solutions. Italy has started a negotiation with Algeria for an MOU of cooperation on clean energy. We have registered a similar interest from Libya. Together with Tunisia, we are working to develop the ELMED project, a power cable which will be a driver for stimulating green power production and ex exchange with North Africa. In this respect, the full support of the EU would be quintessential. With a similar view, we have built an electric bridge towards Montenegro, which adds up the ones with Greece, Malta, and Corsica. 
we have a vision of green hydrogen, according to which we may be able one day to exchange it using the existing network of, of gas pipelines. The ISMED Gas Forum, of which Italy is a founding member together with Egypt, Cyprus, Greece, Israel, Jordan, and the Palestine, is an example of regional intensive cooperation to deploy the full potentials of gas as a low carbon resource. On the same page, the Southern Gas Corridor entered into operation last November with the completion of the TAP has created unprecedented forms of cooperation, showing that we'll, what, we'll, what we like to call the inclusive value of energy. The corridor is a win-win situation for all countries involved, Greece and Turkey included. In effect, without a broader view of common interests, nobody can benefit from the resources available. This is why Italy promotes dialogue also for the exploitation of the vast potentials of gas in East Mediterranean Basin, where our companies are the main actors. Stability and converging views are the only way forward to conduct explorations and to guarantee stable investments and secure the related transnational infrastructures. The value of multilateralism in the area is proven also by the greater attention paid by the Union for, Mediter for the Mediterranean to the energy transition. In this organization, Italy, together with all partners, is working to step up the common contribution to a just and fair transition towards net zero greenhouse gas emission by mid-century, thereby contributing to climate change commitments in the framework of the Paris Agreement and to the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, in particular SDG 7. Investment in this region represents an important business opportunity for energy companies. Synergies between private actors and their contribution to implement a national energy transition plans go far beyond the energy sector alone. The role of the private sector may promote political dialogue, contribute to economic and commercial growth, develop models of innovative business and support the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Italy is in this context one of the leading players. Energy companies such as ENI, let me say hello to Lapo Pistelli, Enel, SNAM, Terna, Saipem, together with a large group of smaller companies represent one of the main engines of the energy transition in the Mediterranean, spreading from the gas sector to renewable energy, power infrastructures and efficiency. A growing number of actors are looking at the Mediterranean from the perspective of energy. As an EU Mediterranean country, Italy believes in the EU's strong role in the region to redefine the great game of energy along the lines of development in the Green Deal for a more prosperous and sustainable economy. Only a deep support from the EU in terms of climate and energy diplomacy coupled with concrete means to promote and sustain the necessary investments could bring the whole Mediterranean basin fully on board of our just and fair transition towards a future with net zero emissions by mid-century. Therefore, it is fundamental to strengthen the link between energy transition and socio-economic transition of the Mediterranean area, reinforcing a southern partnership between the EU and the Mediterranean countries, linking the energy transition of the southern and eastern part of the basin. A local just transition must be guaranteed, especially in those countries where the energy sector is the basis of economic activities and social stability. Thank you. Thank you, Director General. Thank you, Luca. Um, I understand uh, Stefano has, uh, Stefano Gas has also left us for this meeting he has uh, in between. Thank you for your very valuable uh, contribution that I think 
confirms how Italy is committed to be a positive player uh, in the energy agenda of the region and throughout the region, because I think uh, it, is, uh, it is very important to flag how uh, geography helps our country, but history helps our country in really being a knot of the Mediterranean cooperation in all its dimensions. So, uh, as we said before, one fits all uh, ideas and format probably don't work, but somebody who can translate uh, across the different formats, the different levels of cooperation, and the different subregions is uh, is essential. So, uh, again, thank you very much for the work that the ministry is doing with the World Energy Council in general and in Italy. And we are uh, very grateful for your intervention uh, today. Um, which leads me to the fact that we will hear from the complementary picture of the European Commission. Uh, at a later stage during our uh, during our conversation, um, and I think that. But let me let me flag that the European Commission has uh, really been a, a crucial promoter of new Mediterranean ideas over the past uh, weeks and months, uh, with the strategy for the southern neighbourhood, the most recent communication, with the strategy on hydrogen uh, a few months ago. Uh, let's see how this cooperation fits uh, into the framework of uh, what we see on the ground. Uh, Angela Wilkinson has anticipated some of the findings. Uh, let me personally commend uh, the World Energy Council for having added this Mediterranean snapshot uh, to its trilemma. The, 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 the World Energy Council is historically based on regions and the Mediterranean is really the bridge across two. So, uh, I think this uh, snapshot is is very important and very helpful for us. Um, and then we will have uh, OME and, 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 and Huda. Uh, if I dare, uh, Huda, you can you can. Uh, you, I, I hope I'm not stepping into forbidden territory, but um, we'll be anticipating uh, some of the key trend lines of the Mediterranean energy perspectives, the flagship publication that OME devotes, let's say, the World Energy Outlook of the Mediterranean, if I may phrase it so, uh, that uh, OME is due to publish in some weeks. So it's a very welcome opportunity to uh, listen to the main trends. But in order to speed things up and to make things better, I will leave now the floor to Paolo Dermo, who will uh, guide our conversation through uh, the rest of the seminar. And let me say goodbye to Stefano Besseghini, uh, who uh, has been with us, and I, we're very, very grateful to him for this. Grazie, Stefano. Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Marco. Uh, now we enter in the second part of our meeting. Uh, we will have two presentations, two keynote speeches uh, from uh, Huda, uh, Director uh, Huda Benedjan at uh, Halal, uh, Director General of OME, and Martin Young, Senior Director of Scenario and Business Insights uh, at World Energy Council. Uh, we will give, give the floor uh, to Martin for the presentation on uh, one of the, the news of the World Energy Trilemma Index, that is the Mediterranean Trilemma Index that was produced for the first time last year in 2020. And then we will uh, listen to perspective, energy perspectives from the Mediterranean region by uh, uh, Uda. So, um, Please, Martin, the floor is yours for, uh, for your uh, presentation. And uh, after uh, these two speeches, we will have a, an interesting talk. So please uh, uh, stay in, uh, in um, 10 minutes for these two presentations, and then we will move uh, to the talk. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Paolo. And also thank you Wettingly, for uh, organizing this really uh, useful discussion. It's also interesting to be sharing a platform again with Huda after previously presenting the issues monitor at um, Abu Dhabi and sharing a platform there. Um, so let us uh, move on to the next slide, please. The trilemma is one of four of our insights tools that the council has. Um, I like to think of the trilemma as showing the past because what we're trying to do with the trilemma is to look at historic performance to try and look at how we can shape policy performance going forward and identifying the best areas of practice. 
The other tools that we have with the Issues Monitor look at the present. What are the key issues that are rising up? Um, what are the salient points that need to be explored? The future with our scenarios where we can see what the potential different futures are. And in combination, the past, present and future help shape ways in which policies and strategies should be adapted. And our fourth tool is our Innovation Insights area, which focuses a spotlight on particular areas of interest. And for example, at the moment, we are looking at hydrogen into, in a lot more detail. If we can move on to the next slide, please. We have been producing the trilemma for 10 years at the Council. Uh, we started off a little bit longer than 10 years ago, but we didn't actually have the, the beautiful triangle that we have now. We have constantly been trying to refine and improve it to increase its usefulness and usability for a wider, diverse group of stakeholders. If we move on to the next slide, please. The trilemma looks at three different aspects of energy policy, of security, equity and sustainability. These pillars of energy policy, if you will, are actually very common in a number of countries' energy policies. When they define them, they try to look at those aspects those three aspects. So let us now get into more of the, the meat of, of the subject. I'm going to look at the, the top 10, um, top 10 ranks. First of all, I should say that we have more than 10 countries in here because we've also got some tied, um, some countries on tied scores. So for example, Finland and Austria have the same score, so they are both ranked fourth, and France and the UK have the same score, so they are both ranked fifth. As highlighted here, there is only one Mediterranean country in the top 10, uh, and that is La Belle France. But we have Italy knocking on the door at 11. Um, there is a the top 10 ranks are dominated by um, OECD and European countries um, who have had a long standing interest in improving energy policy. One of the things that we are very keen to do with the trilemma is not just to look at um, those who've been able to establish um, sound energy policies, but also to look at those who maybe have not had um, such a good energy. Uh, heritage in being able to build it up, the ones who've really added value in their policy making. So if we move on to the next slide, one of the things that we introduced uh, a couple of years ago was time series tracking in the trilemma. So what we've, instead of just having the snapshot of the top 10, um, top 10 ranks, we also looked at the top 10 improvers. Now, there has been some significant improvements um, since 2000. Cambodia it has Im improved its score by 77%, but you will see that it still, uh, this was from a very low base, so it still has a, a triple D rating. But there's some really interesting st stories when we dig into these into a little bit more detail. So now I want to talk on the next slide, we're going to go and look at the different dimensions. So firstly, beginning on energy security. The countries in the top 10 ranks tend to have um, access to production, but also in cases like Finland, long-standing uh, energy security policies. The interesting part for the Mediterranean region is the fact that the ones who've made the biggest improvement over the last 20 years. There are three um, countries from the Mediterranean region, Malta, Israel and Cyprus. Um, Malta and Cyprus have both made significant improvements, I think largely due to, to two factors. One is the um, joining the EU and the discipline that that has put on their, the policy making. Uh, and one very simple aspect is about holding more oil stocks. But the other point that they have um, benefited from is diversifying their sources. In particular, um, Malta has made the huge improvement because it has been able to link to the European grid. Uh, so 
greater supply diversity. And this is also one of the benefits that Israel has also been able to, to, ex, um, to explore as well, particularly with, with the new big gas fields. Jordan, not a Mediterranean country, but in close vicinity, has also been doing more about diversifying its supply sources. Let us move on to the next slide to look at equity. Now, the equity um, dimension aligns very closely with the UN SGD7 goal, so very much looking at access and affordability. Now, you will see that the, the top 10 ranks are a lot more than 10 because there's a lot of countries that have near 100% access. Um, but interestingly, we have Israel and Lebanon at number 10 rank um, with a very high score because of high levels of very high levels of access and very high affordably high affordable um, fuel costs. The real growth in this area has been from those countries that have been making making big efforts to expand access. So you will see this wasn't such an issue for the Mediterranean area. The big improvements have been in in Africa and Asia. Um, Mozambique has had a huge improvement. If you see Mozambique, Cambodia and Ethiopia have increased their scores by 700 percent, all starting at low bases, but are making huge improvements, expanding access. If we can move on to the next slide on, on sustainability. Here we have uh, another interesting mix where in the top 10 ranks, we actually have two countries um, from the Mediterranean, Albania and France. Um, this is very much looking at uh, low carbon generation. Um, France clearly with its high uh, degree of nuclear power generation. And on the, on the improvers, we have Malta. Very much about the improving access um, or linking to the grid, so diversifying and getting lower um, new forms of power production that have a lower carbon footprint. So those are the top 10 ranks and the top 10 improvers. So let's dig now a little bit, if we move on, to the Mediterranean region itself. And we can jump again. And this slide is the one that Angela shared um, with you earlier. We highlighted this in the, in the Trilemma report last year as one of the new geographies Mediterranean is not a new geography, but for the trilemma, it is a new geography because um, it sits between actually three of the council's regions. We have Europe, we have Africa, and we have the, the Middle East and Gulf states. And there were some interesting, very interesting stories that we thought that could um, come out of this if we started looking at it in more detail. Um, I was also mindful of the very useful conversation we had when we discussed issues monitor uh, for the Mediterranean region back at Congress. So we did a very simple split here of, of the North Mediterranean compared to the South Mediterranean. North Mediterranean, it has higher scores across all three dimensions. And I think it's useful to probe a little bit further into those. If we move on to the next slide, we're gonna focus a little bit more on the North. So we can see that in the North Mediterranean, we, we've got on the overall rankings, the lowest rank is, seven, is 71st, but we've actually got um, four in the top 15. There are a number of, um, we've got uh, two AAA ratings and three ABBA ratings of ABA. Um, Interestingly, the weakest scores for the North Mediterranean are actually on security, where we have got 3D scores, um, where there is uh, less diversity and more focus, obviously, on one or two suppliers. So interestingly, I highlighted Malta is making significant improvement on its uh, on security, but you can see here it still has a D rating, likewise with Cyprus, and again, we also have uh, with Albania. But looking across on the other ones, um, the other areas of equity and sustainability, they're all quite um, quite closely bunched. So there isn't a really poor performance, uh, and it's doing quite well. 
the key part I think to really highlight here, as you're well aware, is that there's no major hydrocarbon production in the North Mediterranean. So there's got to be a focus on looking at alternate supply sources and also greater linkages, um, particularly the European um, single energy market and the, the gas grid and the electricity grid. So that greater interconnection gives more security of supply. If we move on to the next slide and we focus on the, the southern Mediterranean, we see here that there are still some A scores. Um, we have two uh, for uh, Israel and Lebanon um, on equity that I mentioned earlier. There is here a, a greater reliance upon fossil fuels. So that gives a lower score for sustainability and there's less diversity. So those are areas that can be the potential um, areas for improvement. If we move on to the next slide, what we've been trying to do with the trilemma is to move to this scalable con um, framework for it. Um, You've seen the global trilemma. The Mediterranean trilemma for us is one of the country clusters. We want to move beyond this and have national trilemmas where we can focus on particular countries looking at a slightly different. Um, one of the issues you have with the trilemma is we have to use globally comparable data. We have to look at metrics um, that are comparable globally. That does mean at times that some of the metrics, some of the indicators, are not the most appropriate ones for the countries. So that's where we can look at maybe looking using national data in a trilemma, national trilemma, um, so we have more up-to-date data, and we can also maybe tweak the indicators to make them more relevant. I'm sure it will be mentioned probably in the subsequent conversation. We have Lebanon doing very well on energy equity. Um, everyone is well aware that there are there are issues at the moment in Lebanon. There are time delays in some of the information that we've got, including the trilemma. And maybe some of those impacts haven't fully fed through into the scorers yet. We also want to look at subnational. We want to see, we can maybe look at regions, but cities could be, I think, a really important way we can get a trilemma looking much more scalable and broad. So that Hopefully, for the time of St. Petersburg um, Congress, we can have a Russian doll of the trilemmas, if you will, going from the city level at the bottom all the way up to the global, so that you can do a compare and contrast between the different levels to try and find new insights. If I now move on to my final slide, I'm going to um, repeat Angela's slide here. And I'm not going to go into the same detail. I really want to focus actually on the action of what we can do. We really want to see with the tools about trying to support the humanizing energy agenda, particularly seeing about what new information can we provide, new insights to, for a dialogue about the different races to the zero agendas that are out there. Angela highlighted also, she gave a little preview of the issues monitor that we'll be launching next month. And I think this is where we can start finding new insights um, by combining the tools, combining the trilemma and the issues monitor. What are the priority areas that the trilemma is highlighting? And do these co-align um, with the topics that arise from the issues monitor? It was very good to talk a couple of years ago with Huda on the panel about uh, issues monitor um, in the Mediterranean. So it'll but now I'm delighted to be able to finish my part and pass over next to Huda. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. And uh, I give the floor to Huda immediately um, to, to deepen uh, also data uh, about uh, energy balance in the Mediterranean area. So uh, Huda, please, the floor is yours. And thank you, Martin, again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So uh, I try to share this. Um, yes, uh, to share my presentation. Do you do you see it? Not yet. He's he's uploading the image. Okay. Because okay. Now. Now. Can okay. you? 
Yes, okay. slide. Okay, so good afternoon and uh, thank you, thank you. Let me first of all uh, thank Wet Italy for this initiative and uh, Marco and Paolo for inviting me to join forces again uh, for this, uh, of course, timely and uh, important event. So I'm very pleased to be uh, uh, with you and to have uh, cooperated with you for this um, event. Thank you, of course, for all the speakers who have accepted to uh, join us and of course to all of the votes who are uh, listening to us so welcome to all and thank you again uh, let me uh so in the time uh just very briefly present to Ali, those who are not familiar with us we are much younger than uh, than uh, wet uh, but we are the oldest uh, organization in the mediterranean so this year we are celebrating 30 years uh, of existence of OME and uh, we are a non-profit uh, energy uh, industry association which uh, we gather when well, we gather the leading uh, energy companies around the, the region and of course since the beginning we are working in order to promote uh, cooperation between companies and different countries and as i said so we are we are unique uh, and i'm proud to say that we are in uh, of uh, its kind of organization looking at all uh, energy aspects and pathways in the region so 30 years of experience in regional energy dialogue, uh, in energy uh, high-level events, and, uh, and, and many, many of uh, studies. And I'm very pleased to share with you on avant-première, indeed, uh, the main, some of the results of uh, the Mediterranean Energy Perspective 2020, which will be released uh, at the occasion of the forthcoming Euro-Mediterranean Energy General Meeting to take place on 21st April in uh, Portugal. So we are a reference in the Euro Mediterranean cooperation uh, to uh, our involvement as well in the UFM energy platforms, several multilateral fora, and many many uh, EC projects. Uh, of course, since uh, in 30 years a lot have changed, and I have the privilege to be uh, within OME for all this time. Uh, and uh, so uh, we are uh, following what is happening, and of course we also recently went into the restructuring. Uh, which was uh, uh, dedicated, decided to better reflect uh, the current changes in the energy sectors towards more integrated uh, multi technology. For different this issue of security, both of this issue and energy. We have a high which is very important. We invest in the strategy and the national issues. is given attention in the policy dialogue, as it is indeed very crucial, especially for the European Union external energy policy. And as well as a bridge between Europe and Africa, the Middle East and the Near East, uh, we are very glad to contribute to this enriching dialogue and the networking event. So let me now, for the introduction, give you some insight of our MET Mediterranean Energy Perspective 2020. And so how would the energy uh, look like in the future? For this uh, edition of MET, so we used to have two scenarios. This time we have three scenarios. And we, I, I have decided to share with you the result of two of them. The three scenarios we, uh, we have studied in this map. First one is what we call the business as usual, the reference scenario, in which we consider, we assume that the Mediterranean countries will all reach their unconditional NDCs, even the Paris Agreement. So it looks um, realistically a business as usual trend because they commit themselves to achieve these goals, whatever uh, the situation will be. Then uh, the uh, proactive scenario, which is not here, is uh, uh, what would be the uh, energy future if they fulfill all their NDCs targets. And the third scenario, which is the PROMET scenario, this is new within, uh, within uh, MEP. This is a scenario which we uh, intend to be a sort of shared vision for the energy transition in the Mediterranean. So this scenario has been uh, developed in the, in the framework of the UFM energy platform as a, a vision again how to go faster in the energy transition the objective 
uh, which was the agreed on uh, following discussion with experts from all around the Mediterranean region and stakeholders and our partners was to target a full decarbonization by 2060. So we, in this scenario, we assume that the European Union reached their goals by 2060. South Mediterranean countries will achieve 2060 and the whole region will be net zero carbon by 2060. And you see stories, two different uh, figures of uh, uh, the energy mix in the region, uh, stories about CO2 emission as well. In the reference scenario, you can see that, uh, first of all, the energy demand is going to, will of course increase, and the, the, the color of the energy mix will be still uh, hydrocarbon based. So, uh, hydrocarbons based. And if we go on with the energy, it will still keep 80% of the energy mix of the Mediterranean region a hydrocarbon based. So this is if we fulfill the NDCs in conditional. Uh, uh, as a consequence, CO2 emissions will increase as well. So you, you see here that we will have 30% uh, of CO2 increase by 2050 if we go business as usual and 40% of the energy demand. And of course, this is mainly uh, and um, exclusively driven by the South Mediterranean country. But however, uh, on the right side, uh, if, if we, uh, we implement the policy measures that allow to go and to achieve this target of full decarbonization by 20, then uh, you see that the energy mix by 2050 will be greener, but still, uh, no, 49% of energy mix only will be hydrocarbon in such case, and the rest will be based on uh, renewables. We see a great impact of energy efficiency, so we will reduce by 40%. So we will avoid consuming 40% of energy if we uh, go to uh, the, this uh, energy transition path, and we will reduce the CO2, em CO2 emission uh, drastically. They will be reduced by over, almost uh, 50% as compared to the other scenarios. So we have a lot of ingredients which were already mentioned, the strategy, hydrogen strategy, the new uh, European Union uh, uh, vision toward the strengthening the Mediterranean cooperation, et cetera. So we have, and of course, and the, the, the willingness of the Mediterranean countries to uh, go in the path of the energy transition. So here, uh, I wanted to give some further elements uh, for discussion based on uh, this map analysis. And I, I here share with you the three dimensions on the regional, on the regional perspective of the energy trilemma. So the uh, energy security, the sustainability and uh, energy equity. So energy security, this is, this is of high, 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 high importance for the Mediterranean region and particularly for the South, but not only since the beginning and still. So uh, what we see here is, first of all, the Mediterranean region is a net importer. So today, the Mediterranean region is a net importer, and this situation is expected to continue. And here again, we have two different pictures. So if we go a business as usual, we will more or less remain, uh, you see, from 39%, we will have a 40% uh, uh, rate of energy imports dependence in the region. However, if we go to, with the energy transition, this picture changes completely and the region may become net exporter, even 15%. You have on the right how uh, the difference between the north and the south. So in the north, you see that under the reference scenario, the situation is more or less the same in terms of dependence. From 59%, they will improve the situation to 56% by 2050, but of course, the, uh, the reach, uh, if we reach the, agree, uh, the targets uh, of decarbonization, this will be reduced drastically to only uh, 12%. For the Mid-South Mediterranean countries, the difference is huge and the consequences are very, um, could be very concerning uh, in the sense that we have a 9% rate of uh, dependency today, but if we don't accelerate the energy transition, this rate may increase to 30%. And this is really a big, big, big concern. However, 
uh, accelerating the energy transition and uh, reaching decarbonization path by 2060 uh, may uh, lead to this region to become exporter already in 2030, which is uh, in 10 years, and uh, in 20, by 2050, net exporter by 33%. So the difference is big. And of course, the consequence in terms of energy security and um, even geopolitical and all the impacts are really huge here. Uh, for the sustainability uh, dimension, I have on, on uh, the integration of renewable energy technologies, uh, different uh, scenarios and their impact criteria. Uh, the first one in, on CO2 emission and the second one on job creation in the South Mediterranean, with a focus on the South Mediterranean country. Here are two methods of uh, uh, in integrating and accelerating the integration of CO2 uh, of the uh, renewable energy technologies. Uh, as you can see here, by scaling renewable energy, and the difference between the two scenarios is three times or four times when including hydrocarbons as compared to today's situation. So uh, this will uh, have important benefits under the sustainable perspective. CO2 reduction would be significant both in the north, as you can see, and in the south. In the south in particular, emissions will double by 2050 under this reference scenario, but will decrease by more than 40% under the PROMET scenario, thus putting the south med in the same virtual path as the north although, of course, with some uh, time lag. Now, the number of job creation is also uh, important. We've made uh, a study apart from MAP in order to see what would be the impact of on job of, of accelerating renewable energy technologies in the region. And uh, the conclusion is that uh, in comparison to today's situation, we may um, have a 5.4, sorry, times more jobs uh, in the uh, renewable energy sector uh, as compared to today. These are uh, some uh, 30, almost 400,000 uh, units uh, of uh, new jobs created uh, thanks to this uh, renewable energy uh, technology. Now, the third dimension is the energy equity dimension. And here, uh, we wanted to share it with you um, with the, the investment which are needed. So, it is a good a story that we are uh, saying here. It is very important. We would like to get, to get there, but how to get there? Of course, we need to put up um, the, the policies and measure in order to be able to get there. But the, um, how much would this cost? And we made sort of calculation, and these are very many results, or so almost final results. In all in all, uh, by 2050, between today and 2050, 3.8 trillion. Uh, euros will be needed for the reference scenario and eight for the uh, transition, energy transition or prom any, uh, zero carbon uh, scenario, which we call the promet, uh, promet scenario. So 4.8 million. We wanted to look at how much would it be by 2030 to compare with the European Green Deal. And so it came out that we need about 2 trillion euros uh, in order to accomplish so 2030 from that scenario. So which means that we need large and larger investments in order to achieve carbon in the European Union and accelerate transition to the European Union Mediterranean. Uh, just for example, illustration, the extra capacity for renewables in submet to reach their targets five times is five times current levels, 18 billion, 80 billion uh, euros. So, with the European Green Deal, uh, the European Union adopted a clear and long-term strategy to, to become a carbon neutral economy by 2050, in line with its commitment to global climate action under the Paris Agreement framework. The European Green Deal clearly states that the ecological transition for Europe has to be fully effective if the EU's immediate neighbourhood takes effective action. As the closest neighbors to European Union, the South and East Mediterranean countries need to be incorporated into a wider policy package to promote a just and fair transition by exploiting complementarities 
and identifying win-win opportunities. And the question then is how to foster a just transition under a Euro-Mediterranean Green Deal. So to uh, current policies are not enough for the Mediterranean region to curb sizably the energy demand and CO2 emissions, because you have seen that under the business as usual, we're not, get, not getting there. We will still keep 80% of the energy mix based on hydrocarbons, and we will increase the energy, the CO2 emission by 30%. Second, the European Green Deal is a very good example. It's a reference model, uh, but uh, in order to embark the Mediterranean and the South Mediterranean, we need uh, to give uh, some great signal and uh, only a Euro Mediterranean Green Deal can ensure the needed step change. We need regional analysis for in our perspective, this is of utmost importance in order to identify win-win solution and achieve the goals in a more cost-effective way. Of course, dialogue and cooperation between policy and industry stakeholders is necessary to ensure a just and fair transition in both short. And in this sense, I think that I believe, and I'm, I'm sure this WEC Italy OM event is a pertinent example. Uh, of course, I cannot leave you without re reconfirming that based on our uh, established experience in the Mediterranean region and in the energy dialogue, OAMI is willing to accompany you this transition, which requires strong integration between the conventional and non-conventional energy sectors. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Huda. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, and thank you to Martin. I, I, would, uh, I would say that your conclusions are uh, find also a, a, a good news from the European Commission, as uh, Marco said at the beginning, uh, with a new agenda for the Mediterranean and so also with a new economic and investment plan for the Southern neighborhood. Uh, that is a new instrument, a new tool uh, for uh, new investment and new funds uh, help that uh, will help also collaboration, uh, as you mentioned in, the, uh, in your conclusions. And uh, also on the point of analysis, uh, you know that World Energy Council uh, um, is uh, ready to collaborate with the OME and. Uh, uh, this is what we are doing also uh, today uh, and also to advance on the uh, joint efforts uh, between your organization uh, and uh, we have also the chairman of the organization Steli, that will join us in the following day. So thank you very much to me. Uh, thank you. Now we have to continue. Please. Now we, um, we move on uh, with the talk of this uh, of this event, and uh, we will have uh, a round, more or less a round table. We will try to have a round table, a virtual round table. Uh, I thank all the speakers that are connected uh, for the round table, and uh, I also, I only want to remember how we will uh, work in this round table. We will have two rounds of about five minutes for each uh, speaker, and uh, in the first round of the round table, I will uh, give the floor to all, uh, all of you, all the speakers, for a vision and also strategies and plans that your company or your organization is, uh, fast, uh, is fostering for the energy transition. And uh, in the second part of the round table, we will have a second round on uh, more specific items, uh, maybe thinking also of something that will emerge from the first uh, round of the, uh, the talk. So uh, I move on with uh, Rashim Bendali, and I thank, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, uh, the Director General for the Ministry of Energy from Tunisia that is uh, uh, today with us for discussing uh, uh, in this round table about the transition in the Mediterranean region. So the first, um, the first round we begin with uh, Rashim Bendali, uh, Director General, and I will give to you the floor for uh, explaining uh, the vision of Tunisia and the programs of Tunisia for advancing uh, on the diverse dimensions of different dimensions of energy transition. Please, the floor is yours. Please unmute the microphone.
Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you. And sorry for connecting late. I had a problem with the, with my connection anyway. So thank you for giving me the floor to uh, and the opportunity to talk about uh, the case of uh, Tunisia as one of the countries on the Med region. Uh, you know that uh, Tunisia is very well placed within the Mediterranean crossroad of uh, energy exchange. We are playing uh, now uh, a good role in the uh, energy transfer in terms of gas from Africa to Europe via the Algerian uh, gas pipeline and we would like to play a more vivid and vital role in the energy exchange between uh, the southern uh, part of the Mediterranean all the way to, to Europe. You know that Tunisia has engaged into an energy transition uh, since about seven years ago and uh, we would like uh, to uh, make a change to our model. Our current model is basically based on oil and gas. We had a little participation of the renewable energy and we since then we had uh, made uh, uh, a big move in our contractual and in like legal framework to encourage the renewable energies though with the political transition in Tunisia it's not gaining a big momentum but we are hopeful that within the next 15 years we will be reaching 30 percent of renewable energy in our energy mix and we hope we are hoping to get all the projects implemented between uh, now and then in order to install about uh, 1.5 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy. Similarly, uh, we have engaged into uh, an energy efficiency program and we are hoping to reduce our energy intensity by 2 to 3 percent each year, uh, arriving to about 30 percent energy transition between now, between now and uh, uh, the year 2030. Of course, uh, on the renewable energy, we are hoping to reach 30% of uh, energy, renewable energy in our energy mix. This is, in a global nutshell, what we are aiming at achieving. Uh, what, what we are uh, encountering now, uh, we, we are very mindful of what's going on in the Med, uh, Mediterranean region in terms of uh, discoveries of gas, in terms of the EU policy for green energy, and in terms of the big uh, uh, game changers around us. And uh, basically, we are hoping to be part of that because we feel that we can play a vital role. Tunisia is very close, being the second closest uh, country to Europe. And uh, we are hoping to play a vital role in any energy transfer between the south and the, uh, and the northern part uh, of the Med. Uh, we are also very mindful of the ambitious program in green energy as well. We are embarking into a big program in the uh, green energy by hydrogen, uh, basically. And we'd like uh, being Tunisia, uh, Tunisia's offering or is endowed with a lot of energy, uh, renewable energy sources, uh, solar and wind, would like to see the best uh, uh, environment in which with the help of uh, OME and with the help of the European Union, we can participate in this efforts to for the global decarbonization, and would like also to play a vital role in uh, uh, in the energy transition between both sides of the Mediterranean. You know that Tunisia now is an importing uh, country for gas, and as well as a transit uh, country for gas as well. So. We understand that the old model, which has uh, proven uh, to be limited now, and we'd like to be part of the, the big picture of seeing how best we can play a role in uh, this energy exchange between the uh, both sides of the Mediterranean. And uh, we have put the legal framework for that, and we would like to enhance it, as uh, Dr. Hoda just mentioned. We, to see how best we can fit within the overall picture. We, are, we have our own internal legal framework to, to, uh, to have the, the, the right environment to invest in these uh, green energy, but would like as well to see how best we can fit within the overall picture in uh, playing uh, uh, a role. And uh, again, Dr. Huda mentioned as well as uh, the uh, the big uh, uh, discoveries now in the eastern Mediterranean in terms of gas, 
and would like as well to see how best we can benefit from that and uh, seeing uh, the uh, partnership with Tunisia in uh, basically uh, a win-win deal with all the countries who are interested in exchanging either technologies or projects or uh, exchanging uh, uh, gas or um, green energy as a whole. This is in a nutshell what we are hoping for and that's what uh, we are working to. Uh, we are very hopeful that we will move from the old energy model to a more green energy model in Tunisia. Uh, it's not going to be, uh, it will requ require a lot of investment. Dr. Huda mentioned uh, the, the big picture in terms of value of this investment. We are ready to embark with any partnership with OME and with uh, the uh, European Union in, uh, in order to make these uh, projects happen and in order to be part of the entire picture for uh, for this energy exchange. This is in a nutshell what uh, Tunisia is all about in terms of energy and we are hoping to do with our partners either as neighboring countries or within the Mediterranean region. Thank you, Director General, for uh, this first uh... Uh, first uh, address. Uh, I see a lot of um, common points with uh, also the European energy evolution. Uh, let's say efficiency, renewables, also natural gas. Uh, and uh, so I, I see an alignment uh, between uh, the energy policies uh, of your country with the northern part of the, uh, the, the Mediterranean. Sure. So uh, thank you. Now I, I try to, uh, to give the floor to Mrs. Hamrur, uh, Director General of uh, the Engineering Company of uh, Sonal Gas. Uh, Mrs. Hamrur, uh, can you hear us? Uh, can you, are you able to, to speak? Because we know that you have uh, some issues about your, your connection. Yeah, Marco, uh, unfortunately, Paolo, sorry. She yeah. we, we, we're discussing in WhatsApp, she has some issues. So she can hear us, but unfortunately, I'm not sure if she will be able to, to, to okay. speak. In any case, if something is new, I will dare to jump in and to let you know. Uh, okay, so I move on and uh, we, will, uh, we will see if uh, she will be able to, to join. Uh, we, we are uh, talking about uh, the evolution of uh, the energy system, but also another important point that the European Commission also mentioned in the new strategy for the Mediterranean is the digital uh, chapter. Uh, the green and digital uh, transitions are mentioned as the most important transitions. And uh, today we have also <laughs> an issue of uh, technology. You know? uh, so uh, it is very important also to push on this uh, front. Now I will give the floor to uh, Fabrizio Mattana from uh, Edison, uh, Executive Vice President, Gas Assets uh, of Edison. And so Fabrizio, uh, for this first round, uh, please give us the vision strategies that uh, uh, Edison is uh, fostering for energy transition with a specific uh, uh, view on the Mediterranean area. Please Fabrizio. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to share with you uh, the vision of, of my company. First of all, I have to say that I feel uh, very comfortable in speaking with uh, in this panel uh, because I, I find the title of it very fitting with uh, what, what we are doing and what, what we are discussing, discussing. So transition pathways. Uh, I find it. Uh, I, I read it in, with the same with the same uh, vision of what President Bessigini said before. Uh, I find it very appropriate in terms of uh, pragmatism and, and timing uh, perspective. And, and this is what I would I would go through uh, speaking about about Edison. Uh, first of all. Edison being an energy company, I feel that energy companies have an important uh, role, but also an important responsibility in terms of uh, setting the transition, the energy transition pathways, uh, because of their competencies and because of their role uh, in different projects. And, and Italy is at the center of this um, Mediterranean picture that we have been, that we have seen. Uh, between the north and Mediterranean uh, 
country. So that's very central uh, for us. And uh, in what it is on a set uh, as, a, as a strategy is, uh, I think, very uh, simple and clear, but also, as I said, very pragmatic because it's based on uh, targets that are set at uh, 2030 and, are, and it's based on mm, three main pillars. The first one is low carbon generation. Uh, so we're targeting at 2030 to have an energy mix uh, based on first 40% uh, production from uh, renewable sources. We're now at uh, 20%, so 20% is, is a big effort for us, uh, but uh, is is something that is key, uh, and uh, we are we're really working hard uh, to uh, to achieve. Uh, uh, this objective. Second one linked to, to um, low carbon generation is uh, lowering the specific CO2 emission of our generation. And here we are involved uh, again in uh, as maybe first mover on this on this part in the new generation of uh, CCGTs uh, in Italy. So we're uh, targeting and bringing new technology exploiting say the same same fuel so uh, starting from uh, from uh, gas that is uh, in, in our uh, still in our DNA but moving toward uh, new efficiency so we're we're uh, transforming all uh, all the power generation and uh, uh, moving to a new CCGTs with an efficiency that is around 63% is the first one of this kind and is reducing uh, emissions both of CO2 but also of uh, uh, NOx uh, uh, emission bringing a uh, very important contribution to the, the environment. So the first, the first pillar is low carbon generation and, and this is it, so renewables and uh, efficient fossil fuel uh, generation. The second one is sustainable mobility and this is a big chapter for us because it's covering uh, uh, both uh, urban mobility with, with offers uh, and, and, and electricity, uh, cars and, and urban electricity mobility. Uh, an important stream that I'm working on that is uh, targeting the reduction in emission in heavy duty in road transportation, so trucks and maritime transportation. Uh, and, and this is, I think, it's very relevant for the discussion we are having because uh, is a, is a sector. I mean, transport is a sector that is not only a target for the single country, but is a sector that if it's tackled can bring uh, energy transition in a cross geography uh, perspective. And then on sustainable mobility, of course, as other companies, we are targeting the long term, uh, looking at new technologies as uh, hydrogen uh, being uh, the, the most important. So we are targeting sustainable, sustainable mobility in all its aspects, so in all the timing, so short term, urban, mid term. Uh, heavy duty and maritime, a long-term perspective with, with hydrogen. And, and the third and, and last uh, pillar is energy efficiency. We have been uh, hearing also um, from, from different um, speakers about the role of energy efficiency. Of course, we have a, a presence uh, both on industrial sector and residential sector. And here we are pushing efforts uh, in order to contribute with the reduction and, and uh, energy efficiency uh, is also for us a very good link uh, with customer centricity because it's very much linked to the approach and the awareness that our clients and our uh, customers must have in, uh, in the use of electricity. So very, very quickly, these three are the main pillars of uh, energy uh, strategy and energy transition pathways. I think that uh, this is 
what the company as an industrial player can bring uh, uh, to the discussion, but I think it's also uh, uh, a discussion that is important to um, say to bring and to uh, be linked with uh, with countries and policy makers, because we can set our industrial ambitions, but if we move alone, uh, we could create unbalances with relations to the energy trilemma that we have been listening and discussing before. Uh, so the need is to work more on systems interconnections and also here uh, as a company we have a role in, in, uh, in developing and bringing forward interconnection uh, projects but also on market interconnections because we, we, we heard about uh, uh, how in the Mediterranean region uh, resources uh, are, are spread, present and spread, and, uh, and the real target is really to connect these resources uh, and, and to, to rebalance uh, the use uh, of this. So I think this is the, the main challenge for all. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio, uh, for remembering also the importance uh, of uh, interconnections. We will have in this floor together with us uh, also important uh, TSOs and DSOs uh, from Italy and Greece uh, in a few minutes. Uh, thank you for the vision uh, from uh, Edison. Uh, we will uh, left for a second round, uh, maybe uh, something more on uh, the development of natural gas and also small scale LNG uh, after. Thank you. And, uh, uh, let me also thank Edison for having uh, co host this meeting uh, together with Work Italy and Noemi. Um, and uh, now I will uh, left. Uh, I will left the, the floor to Solina Mortada if uh, she can help us from Work Lebanon. Uh, so technical consultant from Work Lebanon that bring into the debate the vision uh, from uh, Lebanon on the energy transition. Please, the floor is yours, Solina. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm glad to be here on behalf of uh, Work Lebanon. And uh, as this session is discussing the commitment of the MED countries, I'm going to be talking about Lebanon's commitment and efforts in the energy transition. So uh, these, this is being done with the support of several partners and, uh, and uh, organisms such as WEC, of course, uh, MEDREG and the IRENA. And the Lebanon's commitment are, of course, uh, in line with the EU commitments and the EU green uh, deals. So, as you might know, uh, Lebanon imports about 95% of its uh, primary energy. Uh, thus, the diversification of the energy mix is a key uh, uh, point to be tackled in the energy uh, transition. So, Lebanon has been trying since like a decade now through the Ministry of Energy and Water uh, to integrate renewable energy in the energy mix. So the first target was in 2009 to have 12% of renewable energy in the Lebanese energy mix. This was developed in uh, the Renewable Energy Action Plan uh, for the National Renewable Energy Action Plan uh, for Lebanon. Uh, as for the current state, several uh, expression of interest and tenders were published and the first power purchase agreement for 226 megawatt of wind were signed in uh, 2018 uh, in the region of the northern Lebanon in Akka. Uh, on the other hand, through the, during this decade, Lebanon has boosted the decentralized renewable energy market through a green financing mechanism. The installed capacity as decentralized renewable energy has reached 78 megawatt and uh, 2019. However, in 2018, uh, the prime minister back then, Saad Hariri, announced a new target of renewable energy uh, in Lebanon, which is to have 30% of the electricity consumption in 2030 coming from renewable energy sources. So the Ministry of Energy and Water has published the updated plan or strategy, which is the updated policy paper. Uh, in this updated policy paper, we reconfirmed uh, Lebanon's target in renewable energy of 30% of electricity consumption in 2030, but also, in addition to reducing technical and non-technical losses and increasing the tariff, the Ministry of Energy and Water would increase the generation capacity 
improve the efficiency and reduce the fuel cost by using natural gas. So for us, the use of natural gas is the key in the strategic transformation of the sector. The fuel diversification will occur through the development of LNG floating storage regasification units. Meanwhile, uh, we have, with the support of IRENA, developed what we, uh, the REMAP, or the Renewable Energy Roadmap for Lebanon, in order to set the plan how to reach the 2030. The implementation of around 5,000 megawatt of renewable energy sources diversified between wind, solar PV, CSP, hydro, and biogas. Uh, currently, the Ministry of Energy and Water with the Lebanese Center for Energy Conservation are finalizing the National Renewable Energy Action Plan for the years 2021 and 2025, uh, where we have different uh, uh, scenarios. Once the document is published, we can uh, define the, uh, better the, the scenarios. So, uh, on the other hand, as mentioned by several of the speakers today, uh, of course, uh, uh, in addition to uh, natural gas being used instead of several types of fossil fuels on the generation side, and in addition to the renewable energy uh, target, energy efficiency uh, has been also uh, a, a key uh, for Lebanon in order to decrease our demand uh, from the energy in general, whether electricity or, or thermal. So, uh, in summary, I would like to say that the Lebanese plan to enhance energy transition uh, is based on natural gas integration on the generation side, as well as renewable energy. So, we hope that we can uh, uh, apply these, these strategies uh, because the experience in the last five years was very good, specifically uh, on large scale uh, uh, systems uh, for wind, for solar PV, and uh, etc. Uh, however, we need uh, to implement these strategies as part also of the mid-region countries participating uh, in decarbonizing the sector and committing uh, to, to, to the uh, uh, global target in, in this regard. So, um, this is a general overview about uh, the Lebanese policies and strategies uh, and how we are tackling energy transition in, in general. Thank you. Thank you to you, Serena, uh, for uh, this uh, uh, this perspective from Lebanon. Uh, and uh, so I, I pick two two of your points. Uh, and one about uh, uh, efficient generation from uh, natural gas, and also ambitious tar ambitious targets on renewables. So again, uh, we see that in the southern part of the Mediterranean, there are two very important points that are in, that are in common also with our country, Italy which um, also natural gas uh, is playing an important role, uh, particularly the efficient generation from natural gas, together with renewables. So um, now I move to uh, this, uh, to the to Maria Rita Galli, that is the CEO of uh, Desfa Greece. So we will have a perspective from uh, from Greece, but but from uh, um, uh, the Maria Maria Rita, can you can you hear can you hear us? I can hear you. I don't know. You can. Can you hear me? Because the line yes, yes, is yes, not very well. in Athens, so the line is not very, very good. No, no. We can hear and also see you very well. And uh, so, uh, please, uh, we we are listening that uh, natural gas is in, an important part of uh, the energy transition in the Mediterranean region. Uh, you, as CEO of this, uh, but, but also as uh, SNAM. Uh, have uh, an important perspective on how, in a country that is very close to Italy, the gas sector is developing. So, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, of course, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, opportunity to, to listen, uh, in particular, to the colleagues. So, you know, in preparing for uh, for this meeting, I went through the, uh, let's say, the Trilemma Index of the report that was circulated, and I saw this very nice map of the Mediterranean uh, Index with the north and the south of the Mediterranean. But then I also tried to, to dig, dive, dig dive a little bit into the various countries. And uh, this, the, 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 this allowed me to somehow have a little bit of perspective, because the more I, if, if you talk about Europe, the more you move from northwest to southeast, 
Of course, the lower uh, the ranking uh, uh, started to, to become. And uh, in particular, you see that there is a block, France, Italy, Spain, and then there is a block which is given by the country in Southeast Europe, of course, um, and not only Europe, but Southeast of the Mediterranean from Israel, Malta, Greece, Albania, and then Cyprus, and so on, where you can see that in particular, the main difference comes from two indexes. Uh, the first is the security of supply, and the second is the sustainability. So I've been looking a little bit at Greece uh, under this perspective. And uh, well, on the first point, the security of the trilemma, uh, in a way, probably the perspective uh, will be much, much better already in 2020, and it's going to improve even more uh, very shortly. Because if we look at uh, security in terms of diversification of supply sources and uh, interconnection, Greece has made an important step up in 2020, of course, with the entering into operation of, of TAP uh, that, and the Southern Gas Corridor that create access, of course, to a new important source of uh, gas supply. And other uh, in infrastructures are expected very shortly from uh, uh, the IGB entering into operation later this year or early in the next one. Uh, the, the new Alexandropoli regasification terminal, and hopefully also as DESCA, the interconnection with uh, uh, North Macedonia that will also enable to connect uh, Kosovo and some countries in the Balkan and increase also their security supply and diversification. Uh, so this is certainly an angle where uh, probably the ranking and the, this investment in interconnection will enable the, to improve the positioning of uh, uh, security. Of course, there is a growing reliance on natural gas, which is good for decarbonization, maybe less in terms of security supply, and therefore Greece is also assessing another important piece of infrastructure that is developing an underground gas storage that would complete and reinforce the, the, the system, the, nature, the gas and electricity system. Coming to sustainability, uh, this is something common to Southeast Europe, there is, of course, still a lot to do, and Greece is working hard in this direction to completely phase out uh, coal uh, in the night. And uh, in this case, again, as Tesla, we have an important uh, role to play, a responsibility, because uh, there are regions of the, of the country which are not yet connected with the gas grid. In particular, the west of the country is not served by natural gas, West Macedonia and West Greece in particular. And in our uh, recent development plan, 10 year development plan, we have increased uh, significant investments in order to deliver gas in, this, in, uh, in these regions, as well as uh, promote. Uh, and uh, I heard you were asking uh, Edison colleagues to comment later, but also in Greece, we are promoting, of course, the development of LNG as a fuel for the maritime sector with bunkering. Uh, and as part of our plan, uh, we are already building. Uh, a second jetty in order to enable reloading of ships in the Revitusa terminal, as well as a, a, a truckloading station to start supplying also with LNG remote areas and again increase the sustainability in the sense of you know displacing more polluting fuels that are still quite abundant also in the heating sector in, in the country. So Greece is very focused in replacing lithium with, with the gas and is also very focused on strengthening the network with more and more interconnection. So I do hope, and that also with our contribution, you know, if we look at this index in a few years down the road from CBB, we might have some A going forward as a country. Thank you, uh, Maria Rita. Thank you. I really appreciate your lecture of the Trilemma Index uh, with the lens of uh, uh, and also Nam, and also thank you for insights on the Greece, on, on the country uh, at all. And uh, I would also add that uh, we, uh, if we would have been in a room and a conference room, uh, now we have uh, hundreds of uh, participants, and so uh, we would have uh, enjoyed also uh, our public. And that's I thank again. I take the occasion to thank you, the hundreds of people that are following on YouTube. Uh, so uh, we will move on in this uh, debate. We will uh, come back to you, Marita, also for a second round for adding something maybe on sustainability and also on the vision that uh, your company uh, has also on the sustainability that is very interesting. 
and that is fostering also in Italy and around the world. Uh, now let me uh, move to Angelo Ferrante, uh, Secretary General Med CSO and also Head of European Affairs uh, at Terna. Uh, with Angelo, we move uh, in the electricity uh, sector, in the transmission sector. So Angelo, uh, please, we have a listening about the importance of uh, parallel importance of natural gas and also renewables, but renewables needs uh, investments also on the grid, on the network. Angelo, can you hear us? Yes, 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 Paolo, indeed, you're right. And good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much to the Italian sector, section of uh, WEC for this kind invitation. Uh, uh, I would take this opportunity to make some considerations on the impact that the energy transition is determining in the evolution of the power sector in the Mediterranean region, trying to have, uh, let's say, a regional overview. Uh, uh, the Mediterranean region is characterized by a strong, although not homogeneous, growth of electricity demand and by consistent planned investments in new generation, also driven by the Paris Agreement that have been signed by all the Mediterranean countries. These investments are mostly in gas and renewables, as it has been said by uh, the, the previous speakers. Uh, furthermore, Angelo, are... may, may I ask you to, to, to speak uh, louder or uh, closer to the mic? Uh, yes. yes perfect. Is, perfect. is it better, better in this way? Okay, so uh, uh, there are significant differences uh, uh, between uh, the European Union and the Middle East and Northern African countries in terms of demand and generation mix that could provide the interesting uh, complementarities to be exploited for a progressive integration of uh, uh, the, the national power systems and, and the market. Uh, these aspects uh, call for uh, uh, new flexibility and the TSOs in this perspective are at the cornerstone of the process because the transition calls the, the transmission system operators to adapt to the new context uh, characterized by increased volatile flows that the TSOs need uh, to control. Uh, so uh, uh, in order to achieve uh, this uh, an adequate, integrated and efficient electricity infrastructure is, is key. Uh, and despite the commitment of the governments and the lowering cost of renewable technologies, uh, uh, the, the deployment of uh, uh, renewable generation projects is evolving at a relatively slow pace, and the degree of penetration in the region uh, is low if compared with what's going on in other regions in the world. Uh, and very often the, this deployment is blocked by uh, the national market's fragmentation, uh, limited, very limited in many cases, by the asymmetries in uh, the legislation and in regulation dealing with uh, renewable energy sources, more in general uh, uh, due to uh, an unstable environment for investors, and also by the lack of power transmission infrastructure, because uh, 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 the uh, integration uh, uh, of renewables, the accommodation of renewables in the power system ma could be uh, highly facilitated by uh, uh, a strong uh, transmission grid, the interconnection of the national transmission grid that would allow to share operational resources through the high voltage grid. But unfortunately, the current inter interconnection level in, uh, uh, in the uh, south uh, and eastern Mediterranean countries is poor and when existing is not uh, efficiently operated. So summing up, we need uh, uh, urgently, I would say, uh, harmonizing rules for facilitating integration, uh, fostering the development of new interconnectors and how to achieve this through uh, reinforce the multilateral cooperation. And this is our, actually the, the, the axis of uh, uh, the activities carried out by uh, METTSO. Uh, multilateral cooperation for us is the key tool that we promote through a fully bottom-up approach for defining uh, a common vision, a common vision at the regional level that uh, improves complementarities and provides a global response to the, the changes in the Mediterranean uh, region. Uh, thanks also to the financing contribution of the European Commission, we have a work plan that consists in a set of coordinated activities uh, for defining what we call the software, that means the rules and the technical criteria 
and uh, the hardware that means what is necessary to develop uh, uh, the transmission infrastructure in the Mediterranean countries. As an example of our activity, I would like to mention the master plan that is uh, our contribution to investors uh, without uh, the intention to uh, replace them in their work uh, that we develop every two years in tight connection with the work that is carried out at the European level by NSOE. Uh, with the aim of analyzing new interconnection projects uh, among the Mediterranean countries and evaluate their benefits at the regional level. That's something that's very often ignored. Uh, we have recently released the 2020 edition of the Mediterranean Master Plan that's available on, uh, on the METSO website that includes uh, the assessment of 15 selected interconnection projects uh, with respect to their commercial and technical feasibility uh, according to three uh, energy uh, scenarios that we have identified. Uh, the overall result uh, deals with about uh, 6,000 kilometers of potential new interconnectors, interconnectors 4,000 of them in uh, HVDC technology. So for a, a potential uh, uh, additional interconnection capacity of about 18 gigawatts and the total investment cost of about uh, 12 billion US dollars, a, a bit more than 10, 10 million uh, euros. This master plan includes also a cost benefit analysis that is shared among uh, the, the, the members of METESO to, to give uh, a concrete and uh, common methodology uh, for uh, these uh, evaluations. This methodology is uh, in line with what has been uh, developed at the European level by ACER and applied by NSOE with some modifications uh, due to the Mediterranean context. Uh, we have launched also a new uh, project uh, at the end of 2020 that will last until December 2022. The project is called TZMED that should improve significantly data and methodology coming from the previous projects uh, and uh, broaden also the areas of cooperation among the TSOs, including uh, uh, also initiatives in the area of uh, operation and interoper interoperability of the uh, power system. Uh, many speakers have mentioned that the Mediterranean is not a homo homogeneous region and that uh, a one size fits all solution is probably impossible to, to implement. And actually, we, uh, one of the activities that we are promoting in the frame of the TZMED project is the launch of a pilot project in the Maghreb countries. Uh, with a view to increase electricity exchanges in the region. This is based on the fact that probably in that region, the process could go faster than in other, in other parts of the Mediterranean. Uh, this is a very challenging project that can be developed only if we succeed in having a tight cooperation with the uh, regional institutional stakeholders. Uh, I will stop here for this first uh, round uh, and maybe... Thank okay, you, something Andrew. more in the second round. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw that you have uh, also put on the table the important team of investments. Uh, we think the chance to, to have, uh, again with us, uh, Stefano Grassi, head of cabinet of the new uh, commissioner for energy. I give the floor to Marco Mongheri if you want to add something, Marco, before uh, giving the floor again to, uh, to Mr. Okay. Grassi. Let me just reiterate uh, that I am uh, particularly grateful to the companies uh, and the friends from the government uh, by way of helping Stefano, uh, who I hope can hear me, uh, to jump again into our debate. Let me flag uh, two or three things that I've heard uh, that seem to be particularly fitting with what the European Commission is, um, is purporting and supporting over these days. Uh, we heard from uh, friend uh, Rashid Ben Dali from Tunisia how Tunisia is developing a policy that is really uh, going on the lines of decarbonization and also opening uh, a portfolio of new corporations, new technologies, and new possibilities of interconnections. And I seize the opportunity to thank him for being with us. Uh, we've heard from uh, Algerian and Lebanese. 
colleagues uh, on the same lines of openness on one hand and on the need to act swiftly uh, on the other hand to build opportunities uh, to, for example, decarbonize power and still have sustainable and competitive baseload. Uh, it was uh, one of the examples that was quoted from uh, from Lebanon. And I have to say, uh, we, we could not be more happy at WEC Italy uh, to also have heard from Italian companies. We had from, uh, we heard from Edison, uh, from Fabrizio Martana, what uh, Edison is doing in Italy with the uh, with the highest efficiency uh, power gen gas fuel power generation that will be made available uh, to uh, any European market uh, in, in 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 these uh, during these days. Uh, we heard, uh, of course, from our TSOs. It was a, a great pleasure to have uh, Angelo Ferrante from Terna uh, telling us about an investment plan that is critical for fostering interconnections in the region. And uh, let me again commend Terna and Angelo in particular for uh, supporting Mediterranean corporations of, uh, of power TSOs. Uh, now I cannot say like no one because you have many partners, but I, I have to say you are definitely uh, a, main, a main partner in that. And we could hear from Maria Rita Garli, and again, congratulations Maria Rita for both uh, the, the the work that you've been uh, that you've been carrying out and you're carrying out at SNAM and your new appointment as CEO of Desfa, also giving us this perspective of how the trilemma evolves not only in the north to south cleavage but also east to west. This idea that the Mediterranean is a region but has many differences and many subregions. So I think Stefano, this blends very well into the need to foster cooperation that have industrial meaning that bring investments and bring new technologies and new ideas and that really enter into the real life of energy systems in in Europe uh, with the with uh, I hope that uh, our uh, colleagues in the panel will allow me then uh, to introduce you uh, to to run your intervention and again I am sorry this had to be uh, this had to be delayed uh, in the agenda but I'm sure everyone is very eager uh, to listen to you, especially uh, as you may have touched on the Mediterranean with Commissioner Simpson uh, <laughs> during the during the last hour. Now, I don't want to have any insight on your on your meeting with the commissioner, but uh, let let me just reiterate how happy we are that you can be with us, and I'm sure that everybody uh, is is eager to listen to your contribution. Thank you for being. Thank you, Marco, and thank you to the World Energy Council for having me here uh, today and for giving me this opportunity to discuss with you the Mediterranean dimension of the of the trilemma. I'm very sorry for the abrupt interruption before, uh, but unfortunately, it was another neighborhood issues, Eastern neighborhood and, and nuclear safety uh, that required uh, 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 required the meeting with the commissioner urgently. And so I had to I had to switch. Uh, I hope my remarks now will not be uh, off message compared to what the the other uh, the other participants as have um, have said. Uh, but I noted the some of the catchwords that you use: the clean energy transition, the the need to maintain competitive base load, investment, uh, interconnectivity. And I think all these catchwords uh, are uh, are part uh, of uh, an amazing dynamism uh, that we see in, in the region, in Mediterranean region, uh, over over the past months and, and and recently in this area. And I think the central question that policymakers here in Brussels are asking is uh, whether this is uh, the hour and the right moment for a new uh, Euro-Mediterranean partnership on energy. Are we having here a new wind of opportunity for shaping a, a different paradigm of engagement with the region based on energy? Because if we have to be honest and we look back at the relationship between the different shores of the Mediterranean, uh, this is a relationship decade old, but full of promises not held, misunderstandings, projects that they were taking off and then they were abandoned. 
and I personally had experience of a number of his tensions and difficulties having worked on the external dimension of migration and on trade in, in, in previous professional lives. But also in energy, if we look at the project like uh, the Desert Tech or the Mediterranean Solar Plan, I, I think we have uh, in those names uh, a legacy of, of initiatives that even with the support of member states and the European Union uh, uh, failed because of a lack of commercial or, or political or political realism. So the question is, is this the time? Why this time is different? And is this a time uh, for a renewed uh, cooperation on energy? And I think the reply that will come from Brussels and from this European Commission is yes. Yes, indeed, this time can be different, and this is the moment to develop a forward-looking, uh, credible uh, agenda for energy cooperation across uh, across Mediterranean. And this can be the tool for promoting the stability of the region, the economic prosperity, and the human uh, development in the region. And I think we have here an opportunity. We have a stronger case than in the past, economic case than in the past, and very clear benefits for both uh, for both sides. And uh, let me stop for one second on, on the idea of a window of opportunity and where we see the, the opportunity. I think there is a, a section in your uh, energy trilemma report uh, which talks about new geographies, new alliances. And to some extent, you can also reformulate it and say in uh, uh, new challenges, old alliances. Now, our relationship with the southern uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, I think it continues to be dominated by the fact that we are the most important economic partner for the region in terms of trade and investment, and for many still the number one political uh, partner. Uh, but this, this uh, uh, relationship is, is uh, tested in this moment by the common challenge of, uh, of an instability that is uh, particularly pronounced in some countries of a southern neighborhood and is compounded by the effects of the pandemic. And as a Europe, uh, we are in this together and we have mobilized uh, through our different tools 2.3 million billion, sorry, uh, to help during the first wave of the economic crisis. But the real challenge there is how to uh, organize jointly a green recovery. And uh, the, this point that uh, Secretary General Wilkinson was making, how we can build forward together and better. And uh, we see honestly that the clean energy transition is offering to the North African countries real opportunities to change their energy infrastructure in ways they can meet their uh, growing energy demand, they can create jobs, and promote equitable socioeconomic development. It's, it's a great tool for diversification of economies and to build climate change resilience, uh, uh, achieving a low carbon uh, economy. And in this way can also help achieve uh, uh, the, their ambitions and climate ambitions under the Paris Agreement. So in a way, it's uh, not only an economic opportunity, but I think we see a space for improving the uh, I will say the performance under two of your trilemma dimensions, the equity, uh, energy equity, and the environmental sustainability. Uh, so if we see an opportunity to accelerate there, uh, using again the Madam Wilkinson uh, words, we see also an opportunity to avoid triggering a crisis. Because we have to be honest, and our Green Deal project will have uh, geopolitical implications, will have a disruptive impact on, on, on the countries in our neighborhood, and I think uh, uh, will enhance the, the need for diversification and economic diversification. And this requires on the European Union a special attention also to mitigate and help the partner countries uh, uh, meet this, this, challenge, uh, this challenge together. Uh, so all of that requires a long-term strategy from the European Union, uh, which serves both interest on, on our side and on our, our neighbours. And we have now, you mentioned it, Marco, in your introduction, uh, this uh, renewed partnership with Southern Neighbourhood, which we adopted last week in the College. And it's a seven-year agenda to mobilise uh, 7 billion euro under the Neighbourhood and Development and International Cooperation Instrument which can uh, mobilize private and public investments up to 30 billion in the southern neighborhood. And the member states are also called to join in and, and, and uh, multiply this effort and pull uh, uh, our respective strengths with us. 
Uh, this is an agenda very concrete, accompanied by an economic and investment plan for the Siphon neighborhoods with 12 concrete flagship initiatives and mobilizing all our tools from technical assistance, budget support, microfinancial assistance. And it's a broad agenda with five main priorities. We have human capital development, economy, peace and security, migration, but there is a central law for uh, green transition, climate resilience, energy and environment fair. And through that, uh, it is our intention to support investments in energy, environmental friendly infrastructure, and various innovative, innovative solutions. So what exactly can we do uh, under this renewed partnership and our this economic and, inv and, investment, and investment plan? Uh, first, I think we want to put energy at the core of our relationship with the, the Mediterranean region uh, because we see a vast potential for renewables, solar and wind energy resources, which is still uh, untapped uh, despite a, a very dynamic development, we calculate that uh, renewable electricity has grown by 40% over the last year in North Africa, uh, with a rapid expansion of solar and photovoltaic and thermal. But still, there is a lot of space in, in generation of ele electricity, uh, a great space in, in the transport sector, heating and cooling sector, uh, in the use of biofuels. And these can generate significant economic opportunities and investment opportunities also for uh, for European companies in a spirit of, 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 par of partnership. And we see a lot uh, in, all, in applying the angle of energy system integration. And we, we already mentioned many of you, the opportunities that we see coming uh, from, uh, uh, from hydrogen. So what are the tools that we intend to use to uh, tap all these opportunities that we see in the region. And I think uh, for us, we have to be clear that we need to avoid the mistake that we did in the past, uh, which was to look at uh, our energy relationship uh, with the, the countries of the South and neighborhood, mainly as a, an ex export import relationship. I think the first angle for us will be to support uh, those countries in their own clean energy transition and in meeting their own growing energy demand. This is a point that also the Italian presidency of G20 made earlier when I was connected on, on a very uh, dynamic population growth and economic growth uh, pushing electricity demand. Uh, and, and I think this is the first uh, angle that we need to have. The second is, of course, Europe will always remain an importer of energy. It will possibly be an importer of decarbonized energy and maybe hydrogen, ammonia and other things, uh, electricity coming from green investment. Uh, but still, we will always be offering an opportunity for, for export and for uh, revenues uh, for the countries in, in the region. Second point, I very strongly support what many of you said. We need a tailor-made approach. Uh, there are different starting points, different trajectories, different stories. It will be crazy to push uh, a top-down model, horizontal model uh, for everybody. We need to be pragmatic. I think uh, uh, was uh, 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 one of the first intervention uh, that said it not to be theoretical, very pragmatic. Uh, we need to uh, support as much as possible capital inflows in the region. And we will do it using the IB and all our instruments uh, because we've seen that the COVID, uh, after COVID, a significant decrease in investment and much more capital must be mobilized. We need to continue to keep the focus on infrastructure and our TENI proposal revision of December is including a new uh, section on project to mutual interest with third countries, which is an opportunity for interconnections with the, uh, the southern neighborhood. And we will insist on uh, capacity building. This is again a point that our regulator, the Italian regulator, made uh, very important to, to foster exchange of expertise uh, models uh, uh, to build also capacity and a common understanding without pushing for a copy paste of European models. But I think the more we have uh, exchanges uh, and twinning between regulators, uh, administrators in the field of energy, the more we will understand each other and we will improve also reforms to in, in, improve uh, the business regulation. Just two words to conclude what we do with the oil and gas sector and the traditional sector. I think we will not forget that in a spirit of pragmatism, we are completely understanding the importance that has in the transition. Uh, as a piece of news, we are we will continue to be present in, in a number of cooperation projects. We started this week 
the procedure to become observer as a European Union in the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum. And I think this is a signal uh, of the attention we will continue to have uh, to this uh, to this region. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we need, uh, however, uh, to accompany this attention to the traditional oil and gas sector, uh, uh, greater efforts to reduce the footprint of the sector. And don't be surprised if I will insist on the importance of reducing methane emissions. We have a strategy there adopted last year, and North Africa is one of the highest uh, methane emitters uh, in the world. I think we calculate that the combined methane emissions of Algeria, Egypt, and Libya is around 10 million tons in 2019. And most of these emissions, at least 50%, can be reduced uh, uh, at, ne at no net cost. So, in addition to all our positive agenda, I think we need to insist a bit of, of these responsibilities. So, we see, frankly, positive implications both for Europe and for the Mediterranean. Uh, we see uh, business opportunities for European energy companies. Uh, we see the possibility to export technologies uh, on which Europe is a leader, from offshore wind uh, to hydrogen and electrolyzers uh, to the southern countries, and at the same time, open channels for exporting green energy uh, towards Europe. We see it as, a, uh, uh, as an element that will promote economic development in, in the region and will expand their trade and economic relations with us, and as an element that will help uh, all of us uh, uh, develop clean energy system and meet our, our goals under the Paris Agreement. All of that, I mentioned the strategy and I'm concluding, is just the beginning of a process. In the coming weeks and months, we will reach out to the countries uh, to try to establish this tailor-made approach. We are advanced with Morocco in, in uh, establishing a green, a green partnership covering several sectors, and we hope to have similar uh, platforms with other countries in the region. And I honestly hope uh, that uh, the, uh, with the help of the Observatoire Mediterranean de l'Energie and with the help of the World Energy Council, we will uh, feed this network, we will feed this contact, uh, and you will help us outreach and engage with the countries in the region, because I think there is a lot of work to do, and we can together build something different, lasting, and mutually beneficial. And I thank you for your attention and for being so patient for, for my intervention. Thank you. Well, Stefano, uh, patience is always rewarded. Uh, and I have to say, uh, this is a, a, a great example of that. Um, I have to say, in a, in a truly Mediterranean spirit, I guess uh, we are slightly lagging behind uh, schedule. So we're keeping, we're keeping our old habits. Nothing is changing. Um, but my proposal would be, if you, Stefano, can bear with us, uh, maybe to give the floor back to Paolo for a series of rapid snapshots so that uh, eventually Lapo Pistelli uh, can, conclude our, can conclude our seminar. Um, you mentioned a number of things. Let me just fix three keywords. The first is regions, so the tailor-made approach. The second is uh, pragmatism that is accompanying each other according to what is there on the ground and the real investment opportunities that we can uh, trigger. And the third is not losing sight uh, of the new opportunities that we can reap thanks to new technologies and, 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 and go together on those. And let me conclude by saying that um, we will be inviting you to lead uh, our next issue of the WEC Dialogues for Italy with these considerations, which is our magazine uh, published um, uh, published monthly, so uh, we will be in touch because I believe these messages are really essential uh, also to the Italian debate. Uh, Paolo, uh, can I give it floor back to you for yeah, thank you. snapshots and then the conclusions and thank again uh, all of you. Yeah, I I would suggest I would suggest to have a, a second uh, round of the round table, but. Uh, uh, if uh, Lapo want to so join, uh, if the chairman uh, Lapo Pistelli want to join for a, a, a comment before uh, the, the second uh, round of the round table, is uh, welcome, more than welcome. Uh, Paolo, it's, it's not a comment because I had the privilege of uh, wearing double hat uh, as an OME chairman and uh, as a 
manager of VNI. Just let me uh, add my comment and my voice to the one of the of the many companies who intervene in the first round by saying that transition usually means and implies change. So it's about how we spend and invest the resources from today in order to create uh, and to invent the energy of tomorrow, sometimes the day after tomorrow. It's not only about tomorrow. So just a, a, a quick snapshot on ENI. So I will wear the ENI hat in this uh, in this uh, first intervention in the second round. Uh, you know the the role that the company has played since the 50s in all of the basin, uh, the southern basin and the and the eastern basin. Uh, frankly, uh, uh, Egypt and Libya are the first and second country in our traditional portfolio, and we we have the main role of stakeholder in Lebanon, in Cyprus, in Algeria, and in some other countries. But I don't want to talk about that. Uh, I, I would like just to say that uh, first of all, we are we have relevant and uh, relevant and uh, relevant targets and milestones about cutting flare into zero in our traditional uh, production, cutting uh, flare into zero in, in a couple of years, uh, working on the methane fugitives on the, on the pipes, uh, working on uh, uh, switching the portfolio gradually from uh, oil to gas. And we're doing that with our partners in, in the southern shore of, of the basin. And we are working with uh, a number of uh, national oil company to help them together with us to transit from traditional hydrocarbons to some projects in renewable energy, because it's quite clear, everybody said that, that the geography is, uh, is very well uh, fitting and performing with uh, uh, photovoltaic, but also with uh, uh, wind energy. And uh, um, we, I would like to emphasize that uh, uh, there's a, I would say a, a success story to to tell, which is about the the gas hub, the Ismed Ismed Gas Forum uh, in the Levant Basin. But I will make some political conclusions at the end. And uh, let me tell you also, and this is my final point, that we are working on a number of uh, uh, very peculiar subject topics, like working with the UNDP uh, in developing the use of uh, uh, LNG in uh, transports in Egypt. Uh, so it's not only about the traditional way to use gas as we are doing in Libya, for example, or in Egypt again. So uh, gas to power, but also using gas in order to uh, uh, water down and lower down the, the polluting degree of uh, mass transports. And f uh, final point, which is unusual, I mean, in this landscape, we are also working in Tunisia in the southern part of the of the of the country, which, as you all know, is the poorest part of the country, in trying to develop castor oil. Uh, castor oil is something that is not, I mean, against uh, the agricultural use of land, uh, can be, and we are trying to do that, uh, can be cultivated in dry land using salted water or wastewater. I mean, it's something that could help also in a transition uh, to uh, electric mobility, like mobility, but using biofuel 100% even in the, in the European continent. So this is just a snapshot because I have no time to do that. And I, 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 I take my, if Stefano will join, uh, will remain with us for, for some minutes, uh, I'll be happy to share with him some of the conclusion that he already made in his, uh, in his remarks. So. Uh, just a way to, to to play my role at the end of this uh, second round. Thank you. Thank you, Labo, for uh, putting on the table also important issues related to fugitive emissions and also uh, flaring uh, activities. Uh, these are all uh, uh, topics that are related, uh, strongly related to the transition also of the natural gas system. So thank you also for adding a biofuel uh, item on uh, our in our talk. Uh, now I uh, start from uh, uh, Ashid Bendali, Director General of Minister uh, of Energy Tunisia for the second round. And uh, I would ask uh, uh, if you can hear us, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Bendali. Uh, I would ask uh, a comment from your side on uh, the new um, uh, cooperation that we have also heard uh, uh, from the European Commission, uh, from Mr. Grassi. Um, about uh, the opportunities that you see uh, for the new cooperation, uh, new cooperation in the Mediterranean area. 
Uh, can you hear us, uh, Mr. Benali? Yes. yes, yes, I heard uh, Mr. Grassi what he mentioned and uh, the way the cooperation between uh, um, Europe and uh, the, uh, the southern part of uh, the Med. I just uh, want to recall one thing, and I'm just speaking uh, as a, a government body. And it's very important because uh, sometimes we view things differently from uh, uh, a company uh, like ENI or, or, or the like. Uh, <clears throat> I recall during the, uh, the, uh, the project of Desert Tech back in the uh, 10 years ago, what we did as Tunisia, we did prepare the legal framework for that. And uh, it takes time for a government to put the, the legal framework for any field of cooperation or any new air, a new field that is not really covered by the current legal framework. We did that, and uh, in 2015, I was behind pushing the uh, renewable energy uh, law. And we had that, and in the fourth chapter of that law, we did promote for the first time the export of, of renewable energy to Europe. Just be at the uh, rendezvous with exporting energy from uh, Northern Africa to Europe. And unfortunately, we didn't receive any project on that regard, and there is no export whatsoever from, of renewable energy to Europe. This is to show the gap between the, uh, the intention of a certain strategy and how the government react in order to embrace the strategy and to implement project in that regard. Of course, this attack, we don't talk about it anymore. And we would like, uh, and the question was put forward by Stefano is that how can we do things differently now? I think, and uh, is it a good time? I think these are the questions that was asked by Stefano. There is no time as a good time or bad time. Whenever the intention is there, when, whenever the environment is there, let's do it but with a cooperation on, as you did mention, on your five uh, items, capacity building and technical assistance, whereby we uh, can be at the rendezvous, we, we can uh, be at uh, uh, where we have to be together. Uh, like now, I can tell you that we are preparing the legal framework on how to uh, uh, at, uh, uh, at the moment of green energy. Of course, there is a lot of work from the government body in order to put the legal framework for that. And we have to appreciate that uh, we have to create that legal framework and we have to create all the procedures and all the uh, paperwork in order to be uh, whenever an investor come or whenever we have to enter an to fit in perfectly within the uh, legal framework of the country. And this is very important. And the uh, legal framework, when it is new, we need to see benchmark, we need, we need to see other experience, and we need to, to put the right framework, not only to hit that particular target, but in order, in order for it to be in harmony with our current laws and regulations. This is a point of very, very important. I don't uh, want to stress more into it in order to be in total harmony together. So in a nutshell, yes, we want to be uh, part of the, the entire game. We want to be uh, play a vital role, but in order to be synchronous with, uh, with everything that is happening around us, our legal framework has to be at the rendezvous. We need to be there and we need to write to have the right uh, investment environment for anybody whether local or uh, foreigners to come and invest in tunisia we need uh, to be uh, ready for that and this is the the point that i want to make uh, once we hit that particular target obviously everything else will fall into the picture which is stability prosperity job creation and you know uh, as much as i do how important these things are, at least in my country that I know where we are going through or we are still going through this political transition and the stability is very important. Once we have, once we have very promising projects and once we have the legal framework and once everybody you know, enrolls in that particular strategy and we know the benefit has got to be win-win. So it's, uh, it's we, we can't, we have to adhere to this uh, approach 
and we have to uh, uh, call for investments and then be very attractive. So legal framework and the business environment is very important to us. So if there is anything we can do together, let's work on it. I represent the government side of it, which means that uh, I know how important it is to be at, uh, at the rendezvous where we uh, have to have this legal uh, and business environment ready for any investor to come into Tunisia to be part of this entire uh, game, if you wish. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Director General. Um, very interesting uh, point of view. And also, uh, it is uh, very important, the availability also to, to collaborate. And also, uh, you are already uh, setting the regulatory framework. So uh, there are all the premises for, uh, uh, for a good uh, collaboration. And now I would like to uh, leave the floor to Wek Lebanon. Uh, for another country uh, view on, uh, on uh, these issues, and in particular the issues of uh, uh, funding uh, new projects for collaboration, because uh, I know that also uh, Solina Mortada, uh, if you can hear us, uh, would, would like to add something on the issue of uh, funding of new projects. Solina, can you hear us? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, actually, I believe Mr. Grassi's message is very positive, uh, optimistic, and very encouraging, uh, not only for the EU countries, but in general for the also the Southern Mediterranean countries. So uh, this would allow, of course, to boost uh, uh, specifically the renewable energy uh, sector because we have we, he had mentioned, of course, uh, capacity building and jobs creation. Um, however, what we forget usually who, who is to protect existing jobs before creating new jobs. So uh, basically, this is always a point to be uh, uh, kept in mind. Uh, yes, we want to create new jobs in new sectors. Uh, however, we need to keep uh, the ones that are existing uh, uh, there, specifically in the current situation um, with the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic throughout uh, uh, the world. Um, on the other hand, we believe um, in Lebanon that with the economic crisis that we are having, um, several uh, delays would occur uh, related to, to this. However, um, the Minister of Energy and Water is preparing the ground uh, to boost the sector further um, by mobilizing private investment, uh, not only relying on, on public investment in order to boost this renewable energy uh, sector in general. Uh, on the other hand, also, uh, as my colleague from Tunisia, Mr. Bindali, has said, uh, legal frameworks are always important in order to uh, give the, the sector its legal dimension and to uh, organize it. So I, I believe in Lebanon we are very uh, to uh, be a partner uh, in any we have already a good track uh, I would say a great track with the, with partnerships in in the region uh, and in, in in the world so um, this is a small message from Lebanon and thank you for having me again with you. Thank you, uh, thank you, um, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Mostrada. Uh, now I, I give the floor to um, Fabrizio Mattana. We have heard before uh, about uh, the vision from, uh, from Edison, and also is important in, uh, among its activities also the natural gas role, also in the transport sector, in particular the development that uh, Edison is uh, pushing for uh, small scale LNG. Please. Uh, Fabrizio, uh, the floor is yours uh, about a, a deep dive into this uh, issue. Fabrizio, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, I try to be to be quick, but uh, uh, first of all, I would like to to remark that uh, I'm, I'm I'm glad to hear that gas is considered still key. In the, in the energy transition, we have been hearing this a lot. Uh, it's not it's not given from, for granted in this period. But I really think that uh, even if, if uh, uh, it's set for the long term vision on uh, net zero carbon, full uh, renewables and hydrogen scenario, 
I think we have to be very uh, pragmatic and concrete, as we have said, and we have target at 2030. And I am really convinced that we cannot achieve those targets uh, uh, in the midterm without gas. And, and I fully share what, what uh, Stefano Grassi said before, uh, we have to think of gas in a different way. And uh, uh, what you've been mentioning about small scale LNG is for me a clear example of uh, a great new use of gas. Because what we are doing there is to use gas in order to substitute, to replace uh, uh, more polluting fuels in sectors as the one of transportation, that could be heavy duty or maritime, where we can benefit uh, from a reduction not only in CO2 emissions, but also in other pollu polluting elements. So I think that's relevant and not only for, for the business uh, target that we can have, but also because these sectors are uh, cross geography, as I mentioned. So if we develop a small scale LNG chain and uh, we can uh, help uh, and, and work together in order to replace with gas uh, traditional fuels, all the area, all the, the Mediterranean area will benefit of these uh, objectives on these achievements. So I think that this kind of example is really fitting for what uh, uh, a regional cooperation in energy transition uh, could, could be. So that's, that's the first point uh, I would like to mention. And on a small scale LNG, we're doing big, big efforts. We're investing in all, in all the chain from, from upstream uh, meaning importing LNG to downstream, so building a uh, coastal deposit and uh, and LNG vessels. So we really believe that this uh, sector will be a very good achievement in the midterm. Of course, we have to look to the long term, thinking to uh, additional solution and even less polluting ones. Uh, well, the last comment that is not linked to small scale LNG. Uh, but more uh, linked to regional cooperation. I'm, I'm, I'm also glad that uh, uh, we've been hearing a lot about uh, ISMET Gas Forum. I, I really uh, uh, share what has been said. Uh, I think it's a very good example uh, of, of regional cooperation and it's meaning that this attention that uh, EMGF is attracting around, around ISMED is, a, is a, a very important platform in order to, to share uh, resources, to, to link countries and also to link markets together with potential uh, projects that could, could raise in the end area. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio. And uh, I take the occasion to remember, uh, I always remember when it comes to LNG for transport, that the uh, transport sector um, we'll see the, the biggest increase uh, in, uh, in demand from uh, heavy uh, transport. And LNG is uh, very important uh, in order to decarbonize and help decarbonize this increase that will come uh, for the, the bulk of the increase on from the heavy transport, uh, maritime and also road transport. So I, I give the floor to uh, Margarita Galli um, for. Uh, uh, we, we have heard about the vision from Desta and also from Tanzanama. Uh, uh, now uh, I take the uh, chance to also give you again the floor, Maria Rita, for a comment uh, we, we said for uh, about innovation and how you see uh, the collaboration will evolve in the Mediterranean region about uh, energy transition and innovation. Well, I think that uh, in respect in particular to innovation and uh, let's say energy transition here, maybe I can uh, wear my SNAM hat, uh, not because Greece is not also following this path, uh, but because of course uh, um, the company I'm coming from has been heavily investing in time, money and resources in the last uh, years now in order to promote, uh, let's say, the use of uh, cleaner uh, gases and so the integration of renewable gases within the energy system, both uh, be, being biomethane for the present and more and more uh, hydrogen for, uh, for the future. 
this is a, a huge technological effort along the entire value chain, you know, from technology to transportation, storage, and, and users. And uh, in, in this respect, uh, um, let's say, I believe that this is very relevant when it comes to cooperation, collaboration, and that, uh, let's say, uh, the fact that now DESFA, the company uh, which I'm today running, uh, has international shareholders who are, you know, very heavily involved in this uh, energy transition space will also help us and the country we are in to benefit from these technological advances. And as a company, we are already being involved by the Greek government as being part of the working group, which will define the hydrogen strategy for Greece. So I see that, let's say, exchange of know-how and competencies when facing such a big challenge for everyone to establish really the new hydrogen economy will be essential to ensure that this become a reality. And we heard, that, let's say, our colleague from Tunisia talking about export of renewables. We believe that, of course, of North Africa will be certainly a very important area, again, in order to, let's say, export ex excess of energy that can be produced thanks to solar in different forms, one, one would be most likely hydrogen, through existing infrastructure, repurpose infrastructure, which we believe uh, will uh, need to be leveraged upon to make this uh, solution also affordable. So, so coming back to the dilemma, one of the angle of the dilemma is the sustainability in economic terms. And uh, we think that the natural gas infrastructures uh, will contribute a lot to make also, let's say, renewable gases and hydrogen in particular sustainable in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita, also for uh, the news about your involvement in the hydrogen strategy in Greece. Uh, that's fun. And so uh, thank you again for your uh, participation. Uh, I uh, would ask uh, to Angelo Ferrante to, to give us uh, also your point of view on uh, what is needed to um, put on, uh, to, to advance on the projects that of inter inter interconnections that you mentioned before. And so how do you see the new, also new funding from uh, the new agenda for the Mediterranean? for interconnection projects, uh, what are the opportunities that you see? Uh, we know that the, the agenda also mentioned the collaboration with international financial organizations for uh, uh, fostering uh, investments in new, uh, in, in new projects for the Mediterranean region. So I would ask you to, to have a quick comment. Uh, so we led to uh, Chairman Lapopistelli to conclude and also uh, uh, our uh, colleague Stefano Grassi to, to listen to the conclusion. So, please, uh, Angelo, your, uh, your remark. <coughs> thank you, thank you, uh, Paolo. Very briefly, first of all, let me only thank uh, Marco Margheri, who mentioned the efforts that Terna is doing in developing the Mediterranean cooperation. We do that because we believe in the Mediterranean perspectives, and it could not be different due to our position and at the links already existing between Italy and Malta and Greece and Montenegro and the interconnection, uh, the SACO interconnector that's uh, connecting Sardinia, Corsica and continental Italy since the 60s of the last centuries. So we are developing a new interconnection with Tunisia and this project is important for us uh, also for the externalities that it could uh, promote. Uh, the Mediterranean integration uh, requires uh, a multilateral cooperation between institutions and companies. We, uh, as an association, talking now as METTSO, I have a double hat as well <laughs> today here, uh, talking uh, as a secretary general of an association that has promoted the technical consensus. We have a good uh, track, a positive experience, but this is not enough. And uh, I think that the strong external dimension of the EU Green Deal would be key for implementing an effective Mediterranean integration. The, the, the new agenda for the Mediterranean that has been mentioned by Dr. Grassi, uh, published last week, uh, gives the flavor of a possible uh, um, support to improve the Euro-Mediterranean partnership, especially when uh, uh, promoting the uh, support to flagship projects in priority areas and energy is uh, deemed to be one of these uh, uh, areas. Uh, but, but there is an aspect that uh, should be uh, strengthened because uh, uh, 
currently is not covered by the EU initiative. If we look at the uh, uh, European context, especially where there is a sound regulatory uh, uh, system, financing uh, is not the main issue. I, I, talk, uh, I say this uh, as a, 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 a TSO. Uh, may be permitting authorization procedures. These are the, these are the crucial uh, aspects to be tackled in our countries. But if you look at the Mediterranean and uh, the master plan of METIA, so uh, gives uh, many examples of this, we have uh, a number of projects that might have a significant commercial viability, but that might suffer financial gaps uh, because of the limited financial capabilities of the involved countries. And for this reason, the uh, European Commission might play a very positive role by boosting investment through specific instruments that currently are missing. Uh, uh, and this is this is this is the gap that has to be to fi to be filled. Uh, I, I, just to conclude, I would give uh, I would like to give an example. Uh, at uh, at Terna, we submitted. There is only at the European level. Let's say that there is only one general framework for supporting investments in infrastructure, and it, it, it is the the, the ten regulation. We as Terna submitted a, um, an application for funding the Italy Tunisia uh, project, uh, the Elmet project, but the application application was uh, was not uh, well, didn't have a positive uh, result because it was all impossible to fit the uh, characteristics of the project with the eligibility criteria uh, defined uh, in the ten regulation and unfortunately the situation is becoming worse to a certain extent Angela, can we move uh, to to the to the closing because we have uh... yeah yes just just the last statement the proposed revision of the 10 regulation is worsening is worsening the current situation because it's putting additional criteria uh, for uh, showing the eligibility of projects that will never never be verified talking about projects with the, the southern neighborhood countries so uh, something has to be done but moving in the right direction Thank you, Angelo. Uh, now I move on. Uh, I move on at the conclusions of this uh, talk. Uh, I will give the floor to Chairman Lapo Castelli, Chairman of OME, that I thank uh, again for uh, having organized together with Work Italy this uh, this talk, this meeting. So please, Lapo, the floor is yours for conclusions and also your remarks. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you so much. So I'll be very short and I'll be very blunt because after having listened to Stefano, to Marco, to you, to Huda, uh, to Angela, and uh, to all the colleagues, uh, there would be at the same time too many things to say or maybe nothing to say, nothing to add. Uh, so allow me to, first of all, to, uh, to, to say a big thank to all of you because I guess we spent three hours, uh, very dense, very full of content and very full of insights from all of our, of our countries and full of messages uh, uh, sent in different directions. And let me not conclude, but let me uh, wrap up with four comments uh, very shortly. The first one, um, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm old enough uh, to remember that uh, in my personal experience, when I was young, uh, the Med Basin uh, has been considered for so long as a place uh, useful for a very nice and uh, uh, sound narrative about uh, civilization. We have been for so long time considered the, the perfect place where the old ancient religion and civilizations had to meet each other, a very nice rhetoric uh, for so long time. Then somebody came and talked about the clash of civilization, but this is another story. And th this has been the framework for the past. Then in the present, for too much time, uh, we have talked about the Med Basin only focusing about migration, 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 migration. So this has been the, the, the B side and the bad side of this border, quote unquote, between Europe and Africa. And I hope, and this is my first comment, that we uh, can be able uh, to frame the Basin 
not always for the good and uh, rhetoric aspects of our re relationship, and not only for the bad and traditional, uh, I would say, bad money, uh, the, the bad money of the politics, which is the narrative about migration, but talking about issues, concrete issues, and energy is one of that. The second message, Stefano, I, I have to tell you, uh, have been one of the, one of my last trips be, uh, before the pandemic has been to Cairo in January 2020 when we had our assembly uh, of OME, Huda is smiling and I'm smiling too because that, that has been a, a wonderful experience. And drawing some conclusions at that time, and we were before COVID pandemic and were before the next generation EU. I said something and I, I'm keep repeating the same mantra. I am literally scared, scared that the Green Deal and the, the very ambitious pathway to energy and climate neutrality of the EU can become vis-a-vis -vis the basin, vis-a-vis -vis Africa, not a bridge, but a wall. Uh, and you know what I mean. So um, that we will be on the global stage the uh, very ambitious vanguard of something, and we will left somebody behind, lagging behind. So I felt when I was in Cairo, uh, the big risk of a divide in the conversation between Europe and the rest of the world, Europe and in this case, the south of the basin. I know that's my, I mean, this is not my personal opinion, this is well written in a number of documents that we will win the global fight against climate change, climate change, not in Europe, but maybe in the Far East. I mean, we are actually less than 9% of the global emission. We will be less than five at the end of a decade. And so my best advice to all my European citizens and friends is, please, let's spend all together the same amount of political capital in making some political outreach in China, in India, in Vietnam, in Pakistan, in Indonesia, in the US, and it's good news that the US are back on stage with Joe Biden. But if I have to focus on the relation between EU and, and Africa, EU and the Basin, please, 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 let's use the Green Deal in order to build bridges and not walls uh, among the two basins. Because my perception is, is a big divide in the conversation. Um, the um, third issues, uh, very simple. We understood very clearly uh, this afternoon, uh, to listening to all different friends, that trans transition is not going to be a free lunch. Transition is, is a really hard pathways. And so uh, on the one hand, I mean, I, I think it's a reality. There will be winners and losers because every time you, you are changing paradigm, you have winners and losers. But we are not the same kind of man that we were two centuries ago. So we have to work in order to avoid a big split between winners and losers in this transition. So uh, my my point uh, is that we have to, on the one hand, uh, uh, trigger energy transition to economic development. And this is really urgent in some countries of the southern basin. Uh, we need to uh, help and support southern economies to other some of the southern economies to overcome the big risk of the rent economy uh, is not so easy uh, to come out from a hydrocarbons bubble and to make uh, big differentiations in, in economy. Uh, this is a risky business and your natural approach is to rely on your traditional resources. So it's very hard to, tra to transit from one model to another. And, uh, and so in order to differentiate this matrix of economy and in order to support and to trigger energy transition to economic development, uh, especially in the poorest regions, uh, we need a, a big support from Brussels, a big support from Brussels. And, uh, uh, and I think uh, this, is a, this is a third comment in this, uh, in this big chapter of comment uh, that we were used, we have been used to uh, connect usually the South bilaterally to the North or a Southern country bilaterally to Europe. OK, it's not only about uh, one size fits all. I think that we uh, we should be more carefully, uh, more careful in trying to connect also the southern uh, basin horizontally. You know that there are many more connection between Tunis and Brussels, Algiers and Brussels, uh, Tripoli and Brussels, uh, then among these cities, these states, 
uh, respectively each other. So I think we need to work on, on many different uh, axes, vertical and horizontal. One size doesn't fit all, but we also need to uh, pay attention to the relation that all of these countries have uh, between each other, among each other. Um, another, another very small comment. Um, uh, Marco was talking about regions, was emphasizing the word region, and this is about uh, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, I would like to, I, I agree with him, uh, we agree with this point, but I would like also to, I mean, this is, this will be one of the main, I guess, and I hope, uh, one of the main uh, chapter of my presidency chairmanship in OME. Um, it seems to me that we have split too much the conversation between the relation between the EU and the Southern Basin and what is happening in the Eastern Basin. So the East Med gas hub is something, and then you have the relation with the Maghreb areas. Uh, I think that we need to use all the political critical mess that the Southern Basin and the East Med can give to us in order to give priority to the Med conversation in the Brussels agenda. Because if we split too much the conversation, we don't reach this critical mass in, in critical mass in what we need in order to uh, upgrade the ranking of the Med Basin in, in the Brussels agenda. And I think that if you add all of the single issues that you can take from the fragile uh, democratic lab in Tunisia, the transition in Algeria, uh, the low intensity conflict in Libya, the transition in Egypt, what's happening in, in, with the energy diplomacy between Israel, Egypt and Jordan, uh, the, tr the, the, the big attempt to catch up from Lebanon, the unsolved dispute between Cyprus and Turkey, and I could add also the Adriatic shore of the basin, you have enough critical mass to give priority to the Med Basin. This is something relevant, not only for Italy or for the southern country, but it's relevant for Europe. And last but not least, uh, I, I, I want to remain very short. I take the last comment that uh, um, that was done on the on the rules. I would say rules and investments. Please, please, please. Uh, uh, we have and I talk as a European to simplify as much as possible the framework. Uh, I'm I'm not talking about the basin. Just let me quote what happened about the external investment plan. Uh, which was devoted to the whole of Africa, so not only to the Bad Basin, and was devoted to so many issues. And I can compare, actually, uh, the kind of announcement that was done, uh, the expectations that, that were behind the external investment plan and the concrete outcome, the leverage that didn't happen or that never happened or didn't happen uh, to, the, to the extent of the expectations that uh, the former president of the, of the European Commission uh, had put in the debate, why? Because it's so hard to deal with, uh, we know, the European rules. So let's try to simplify the rules in order to favor investment in the South, in order to support companies who want to get there, in order to be compliant with uh, all of the norms and rules that Brussels is giving. So I'm talking maybe as a simple C European citizen, but I think that also from a company point of view, this is very well perceived. Um, last but not least, Stefano and uh, all of my friends, uh, thank, thank to WEC for this uh, cooperation. We will keep going on with this uh, degree of cooperation because we we have, I mean, the same mandate on the one hand to uh, for, for many of the reasons that I mentioned. And uh, Stefano, because you are representing uh, in an in a, in a ideal world, the EU bubble, the EU commission, the EU government, you are Europe. I mean, in this debate, you are playing the role of Europe. Okay, yes, you have a flag behind you, and I have the, the map of Egypt behind me. Uh, you see the offshore of Egypt behind me. Uh, please uh, uh, use as much as you can OME, uh, because the OME, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the organization. Uh, we, we have a lot of goodwill to enlarge the basis of our membership, to give access to countries that usually are not part of this platform. We are enlarging the scope, talking more about uh, transition and climate and the way to support uh, uh, the transition from traditional energy economy to the new one. So please, uh, I mean, we are we are your client. Uh, we are uh, we are your customer. You are you are one of our main uh, sponsor in what we are doing 
in terms of research, we would like also to, on the one hand, to advocate more and more the role of a Bayesian vis-a-vis -vis the EU stakeholders. And on the other hand, we would like to be also more supportive vis-a-vis uh, -vis our members in order to help them to put their project on the ground. So to be uh, not a gatekeeper, but a, but a good supporter of their relation vis-a-vis -vis Brussels, because Brussels is somehow um, not dictating, but, but, but giving us the timeline, the guideline, the norms, the money uh, to help to transition in a better way. So please use us as much as, as we can, because I guess that we are the best friends of the Basin and also a good perspective to uh, cross a lot of different ideas, a lot of different uh, uh, comments and suggestions that are coming from the North and from the South. This is my conclusion and I would like to thank all of you for being with us and I give back uh, the floor to Paolo for some, I guess, some greetings or some uh, conclusions. I am happy to, I only to thank uh, all of you because after your conclusions, I couldn't add uh, something or anything. So, uh, so uh, thank you very much to hundreds of people that followed us on YouTube. Thank you to all of you speaker. Uh, let me to thank uh, in particular uh, Mrs. Hamrur uh, that uh, uh, was not able to uh, speak, speak but uh, listened to, to us uh, for all the time. Uh, and also uh, thanks to Oimi. Uh, for sure, and that is on that also organized together with us uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, we will continue this dialogue for sure. We will send the proceedings of this uh, of this meeting to hold the network, and also we'll uh, we summarize some takeaways uh, uh, useful also for our institutions in Italy, um, because the Euro Mediterranean dimension is uh, very important also for our national institutional national stakeholders and. Uh, uh, last but not least, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Grassi, for uh, staying with us uh, and also for listening to the conclusions. Uh, I uh, confirm the availability also of the World Energy Council Italy so to, to collaborate and also to provide a platform for discussing on the Euro-Mediterranean collaboration. Thank you, and uh, uh, I hope to see you uh, in person uh, in a certain point uh, during the next month or uh, in a year, maybe. Physically, 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 Paolo. physically we need yes. to meet us physically. Physically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very bye. much. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Huda, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, congratulations. Was really congratulations to you, to exactly. your stakeholders, and uh, a, a great pleasure as always. And so, hope we next time we will do it physically, like uh, yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> but even though like this. Congratulations, it was really a great pleasure and uh, whenever you wish. Thank you very much. And Hi, Huda. Hi. Thank nice you. To see you. Nice yes. to see you. So and excuse, excuse to, uh, us if we if we we press you on uh, on speakers oh. and also on uh, collaboration, oh, well. but uh, no. you are really, really a very a very good and strong partner of no, the no. So we have uh, so it is uh, we are a dream team so no problem yeah. <laughs> okay. absolutely and now okay. i hope you know we have uh, the couvre feu so i i was i am supposed to be at home at six o'clock but so i will make uh, hopefully i won't have any penalty because i have to otherwise if i am controlled i will pay 135 euros i will send you the bill. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay <laughs> So, uh, but I hope see to you. see you soon. And whenever you wish, it would be a pleasure. Okay. See you. Thank you. Again. Bye. Bye. Bye.